Welcome back, podcast world. It's time for episode 402 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode of the show is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at www.dankseed.store. It has become a tradition that we start the podcast off by talking about what I'm smoking. Today, I've been taking dabs of vanilla cookies batter from our friends at Apothecary Farms. The label says this concentrate has 79% THC and 94.4% total cannabinoids. This concentrate tastes delicious. And to tell you the truth, I am nicely medicated from this concentrate. It has got a nice, really heavy buzz. It's got me nice and mellow. I am just chilling out. I really like this concentrate. This episode is going to be another compilation of grow lessons. This is going to be a repost of episodes 359, 360, 362, 363, 64, and 365. So ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, let's jump right back in to a long group of grow lessons. Oh shit. Welcome to the show, podcast world. It's time for episode 359 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode of the show is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at Dank seed.store. I like to start the podcast off by letting you know what I'm smoking. Today, I'm taking dabs of Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract from Fuego Extracts. I really love the flavor and aroma of this concentrate. It smells like Jack Herrer and bubble gum, and when you dab it, it leaves a sweet, soft bubble gum flavor on your mouth that just lingers for a long time, and the high goes straight to the head. I really like this concentrate. One thing I am going to complain about is the packaging. These little plastic jars get stuck. The Fuego jars get stuck every time I buy them. It is a pain in the ass. Then they're putting the jar inside of a black bag with a drawstring, kind of like a little tiny Crown Royal bag. The jar has stickers on it to indicate the brand and the strain. The little black bag has a bunch of fibers that come off of it. So now I've got a jar that looks like it's got long black hairs hanging off of it. I don't like that at all. It's unappealing. There's no need for that bag. It's a waste of material. It's another step in the packaging process, and it is completely useless. Then after they've put the jar in that bag, they place that bag inside of another box, which slides into another box, which is all beautifully decorated and well-labeled. It is a lot of packaging. I'm sure most of that packaging is because of the Colorado compliance laws, but I would like to see less packaging from the concentrate companies. I feel like I throw away a lot of packaging. All right, you guys. So let me be completely clear. The concentrate is amazing. The Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract tastes great. The high is perfect. My only complaint is with the packaging. And that is not just Fuego. I just happen to be using Fuego products today when I'm talking about this. A lot of the companies are using too much packaging. And I understand it's Colorado law. We've got to be compliant. I get it. I just wish there was a way we could do this more efficiently and more environmentally friendly. All right, you guys, let's move forward with the show. This is going to be another grow lesson. This is going to be the seventh lesson in a long series of grow lessons. In this episode, I want to talk about planning your integrated pest management. Everybody likes to think they will not get bugs. Everybody likes to say that's not going to happen to me, but guess what? It will. And the only way you can prevent it is by starting an integrated pest management system while you're planning your grow, while you're setting up your grow, and having it in place before you ever introduce plants into your grow environment. Now, let's talk a little bit about integrated pest management. What is the goal of our integrated pest management system? The ultimate goal is to keep our garden free of pests and bugs. A good spot to start would be knowing how to identify the bugs we are looking for and the damage that they will leave. Now, what insects are we going to find in our cannabis garden? The most common problem we are going to find is spider mites. Spider mites are very small. You are very unlikely to see a spider mite unless you flip over a leaf and look at it and do some investigating. What you will see is spider mite damage. If you've got a leaf that looks like somebody has just been taking a needle and poking little dots in that leaf or something's been sticking its fangs in there and sucking the juice out of those little spots, 
That is spider mite damage. Learn how to identify spider mite damage. If you see damage on a leaf, pull that leaf off, flip it upside down, and look at the underside of the leaf. Along the main vein of that leaf, tucked right up against that vein, you will see spider mites and spider mite eggs. Those little dots you see, those are spider mite eggs. Those little itty bitty dots that are moving, those are the spider mites. They are there. It is time to treat for them. Depending on what cycle of growth you are in, treating for spider mites can be very easy. It can also be kind of a pain in the ass later in flower. If you learn how to identify spider mite damage and learn how to identify spider mites, finding the problem early and correcting it should not be a problem before it gets out of hand. Another pest that is very common in the garden and very easy to identify because of its damage is a thrip. A lot like a spider mite, the thrips like to suck the juice out of our plants. After they do this, they leave a little trail of gooey stuff called honeydew on the leaves. If you see a little trail of silvery, shiny, shimmery stuff left on your lower leaves, you probably have thrips. If we become familiar with what thrip damage looks like, we can identify the problem sooner, and that makes it really easy to eradicate our problems. So my point is, knowing what to look for will be seriously advantageous when it comes to treating for a pest problem. Another common pest you're going to run into is the white fly. What does a white fly look like? It looks like a little piece of ash just flying around, just a little white fly. It'll start off with two of them, then the next day you'll see 200 of them, then the next day you'll see 2,000 of them. White flies multiply rapidly, but once you see them, they are easy to get rid of if you understand how to combat them. So the very first step of an integrated pest management system is learning to identify the damage caused by common garden pests. Once we know how to identify the problems, then we can identify the pest, then we can decide on the course of action to treat that problem. Also, it is very important to treat for the correct pest. Some pesticides will work on a broad spectrum of pests, but if you're using specific pesticides or if you're using specific predatory pests, you do need to use the correct method of attack. In today's market, we can't afford to spend money on a product that does not specifically attack our problem, and also we can't spend time applying a product or releasing predators that are not going to get in there and eradicate our problems. So learn how to identify the signs, then identify the actual pest, then we can dial in and attack to eradicate our problem. Now let's talk about a few ways we can prepare our grow and prevent pests from entering our new garden. Cleanliness is a huge factor when it comes to keeping bugs out of our garden. Everything that goes in that garden is taken in there by you. You travel in and out of there, you take things in and out, it is your responsibility to control what goes in and out of that grow. One way to prevent contaminating your garden is to have dedicated garden clothes. Don't come from a hike. Don't come from the grow store. Don't come from work. Don't go from wherever you are into your grow room. Have specific garden clothes. Change your clothes. Change your shoes. Change your hat. Don't take your daily clothing into your grow room. Who knows what's on you? Maybe you've been petting a dog. Maybe the dog was outside leaning against the tree. Maybe that tree had aphids. That dog came in rubbed up against your leg, you and the dog spent a minute together scratching on each other, then you went to the grow, you just took those aphids from the tree to the dog into your garden. Try to prevent that sort of thing. Be very careful. I've got dreadlocks down to my knees. I wrap my dreadlocks up in a specific hat before I go into any grow. If you've got dreadlocks or long hair, I suggest you put it in a hat of some sort, maybe a hairnet, whatever it takes. My hair would not fit in a hairnet. I wrap my dreads in a big bun on top of my head. I wrap that in a piece of material that wraps real tight. Then I slide a dreadlock hat over that. So I'm double wrapped. Nothing will get in. Nothing will get out. I won't transfer any problems from grow to grow or room to room. So if you've got dreadlocks or long hair, I highly recommend you keep it wrapped up maybe in a hairnet or something similar, maybe a dread hat just where it's contained in there and not exposed. That way you can prevent moving spider mites around through your hair. And some of you guys with the big beards, you may want to consider a beard net also, not just to prevent the bugs from getting into our hair, but also to prevent our hair from sticking to the buds. Nobody wants to buy a bud with a big hair in it. So change your clothes, keep your hair tied up, and then let's get back to that dog I was talking about. I don't recommend having pets in the grow room. I see a lot of pictures of people with their dog or their cat in the grow room talking about it's their, their guard dog or their mascot. That's cool if you want to do that, but I don't recommend it. Like I said earlier, your dog or your cat goes outside, it rolls around in the dirt, it rolls around in the bushes, it just goes everywhere, who knows what it's getting into, then 
you let it walk right into the garden. Maybe it walked up right up against a plant that was covered in spider mites and you had no idea. Now that dog is in your garden rubbing up against your plants. Guess what? Free spider mites for everybody. I don't recommend having a pet in the grow. If you insist, do your thing. That is your grow. But in my opinion, that is a huge risk for bringing bugs into your garden. Another thing I would recommend is that if you've got an outdoor grow and an indoor grow, don't bring your tools from that outdoor grow into your indoor grow environment. You may be bringing problems. And sometimes I know I sound like I might just be paranoid, but it's better to be paranoid than to make stupid mistakes. Now, as long as you're changing your clothes, you're keeping your hair clean, you're keeping your shoes and your equipment clean, and you're not letting your dog or your friends in your grow room, there shouldn't be a way for any pests to get into this grow. You may have some cracks in the walls. There may be gaps in your building. That's always going to happen, but we're not going to drag them in there on our own. If they find a way in, we will deal with that. Now, once you're certain you've minimized the opportunity for pests to enter your grow through your own doing, we need to think about treating the clones that come into our grow before they are introduced to population. Wherever your clones come from, if it's your best friend, if it's a dispensary, if it's some guy on Instagram, wherever they came from, treat them as if they are contaminated with some sort of pest issue. Never introduce clones into your general population without some sort of quarantine period. If your room is brand new, you don't have bugs. Why take plants in there that have bugs on them? We can treat those plants before we take them into our main grow room. If you've got a room with plants going, why would you want to introduce a plant with bugs on it into that room to contaminate the entire grow? If you get clones from anybody, isolate them, quarantine them, investigate them, get a jeweler's loop and go over the leaves and see if you can see any signs of bugs on the top or bottoms of those leaves. If you see any pests, now you have to decide if you want to keep that clone or if you're going to treat it and try to eradicate that problem before you introduce that clone to your general population. If I got a clone that had bugs on it, I would probably throw it away unless it were some super elite cut that I could never get again. Why start with problems? I wouldn't even allow that to make it past quarantine. If it looked like it was clean, I would still probably treat it. I would treat it with whatever pest management system I have decided to work with. If I'm using sprays and oils, I would heavily treat it with multiple oils several times. It would probably spend a week in quarantine. The first day, it would get blasted with something. On day three, it would get blasted with something different. On day five, something different. Then we're going to look at it. If I feel like it's safe and clean, it may enter general population on day seven, or it may get treated one more time, depending on how it looks to me. If I were working in a facility that did not use spray applications, I would put that plant in an isolated area with enough light and living conditions to survive for a few days, and then I would start heavily applying beneficial insects. I would build up a colony of predators on there. Hopefully, they would go through and eat anything that was causing me a problem, and by day seven, I would be safe to enter that clone into general population. But honestly, if I got a clone and it was contaminated, I probably would just destroy it. It wouldn't even make it past the inspection stage. It wouldn't even get into my grow. So as a grower, it is your responsibility to check incoming clones and check them thoroughly, no matter where they came from. If it came from your best friend, if it came from a dispensary, if it came from somebody on the internet, it is your responsibility. You cannot blame anybody for giving you a clone with bugs. That is your fault. It is not their fault. So treat any incoming plants as if they are contaminated. Isolate them, treat them, and continue to monitor them until you are certain the problem is not there or has been eradicated. Now, another very common way for people to get garden pests is through store-bought soil or soilless mix. A lot of people try to blame specific brands for being infested with specific bugs. I find that to be inaccurate. Think about it this way. Brand A is made in one area in California. Brand B is probably made in another area of California. And brand C, we'll just say that it's manufactured in Colorado. So all three of those brands are made. Then they're all shipped to a warehouse. Sometimes these warehouses store their soil in pallets outdoors. Now, if one of those pallets had a little bit of bugs in it, they started thriving in that one pallet of soil. Then they moved over to the next pallet. Then they moved over to the next pallet. Now, they are in brands A, B, and C. There is no way to blame a specific soil company for giving you bugs. It was probably the warehouse in which all of those pallets were stored is where your bugs came from. So let's try to get away from blaming a specific brand for having specific bugs in there. That's unfair and probably inaccurate. But it is a fact that our soil does come with bugs quite frequently. A lot of times you'll notice this when you're transplanting. You'll stick your hand in there 
and a little bug will just fly right up. It's usually a fungus gnat or a white fly. It'll just fly right up out of the soil. You know they're there. Now it's time to start thinking about how you are going to treat for those pests. Other times, you don't see those soil-borne pests until the first time you water. You just potted all those pots. You got a whole bag worth of soil worth of up pots done. You're feeling really good about life. You got the grow room all organized. You mix up your nutrients. You go to water. And that first batch of water that hits that soil, you see little bugs come flying out. Those are fresh bugs. They came fresh with the soil. They're not a big deal as long as we know how to identify the insect and we know how to properly treat for that problem. Treating for soil-bound pests is very easy. You can either purchase predator insects that will get in there and eat that specific pest, or we can mix up a root drench, which is a basic pesticide, and you mix it with water, and then you water that into the plants just like you would when you normally water. Then that pesticide gets down in there in the root zone, and then it will eradicate any pests that are in there. The things you're most commonly going to find in soil are going to be white flies. You'll probably find some fungus gnats, and I quite often have found thrips in my soil. So just know that your soil may have bugs in it. Be aware, be looking, and be prepared. And once you see some pests, identify them, then start thinking about eradication strategies. I do plan on giving you options for eradication strategies, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. There are countless options and variables when it comes to deciding your integrated pest management, but I want to give you guidance to let you decide and modify your own pest management system to where it fits with your grow style, with your grow environment, and also it's got to fit your budget. So I'm going to give you a good guideline on how to take care of pests in your garden, but it is up to you to implement and modify these practices to work for you. All right, so we've covered most of the ways that we are going to introduce pests into a grow. Let's talk about the other ways pests are going to find their way into the grow. They're going to come in through your venting and your ducting. If you have any spots that are not sealed up, a spider mite or a little bug could just wiggle its way right through there. It's going to smell that sweet ganja plant. It's going to feel that warmth from the light and it's going to go, man, I want to be in there. And it's going to just go that way and then it's going to tell all of its friends, hey, bro, I found a way in and they're just going to start parading in. So any cracks or gaps in your structure, need to be sealed. If you can find a gap or a crack or a hole of some sort, put some caulk in there, put some tape over it, seal it up super tight so that the bugs cannot get in there. Now, it's ideal to have a completely sealed room, but I understand that that is not always a viable option. Since we do have the opportunity to get bugs in there, our next step is to have a way to monitor and indicate the presence of pests. And the easiest way and most affordable and cost-effective way to do that is first by scouting. You need to spend time every day looking through your garden to see if you see any signs of bugs or bug damage. Scouting for bugs is free. It just takes time. Depending on the size of your grow, this could take anywhere from five minutes to a full hour. But it is important work. Put on some good music, get in the zone, and scout for pests. Train everybody in the grow how to identify signs of pests and also teach them how to identify which pests they're dealing with. If you do discover pests, have a way to mark the plant and also mark on paper where it was in the facility. You probably have row numbers or room numbers, or if it's just a home grow, just plant number three or the plant in the middle, just kind of mark down roughly where it is and then start thinking of a strategy. If you're not the one in charge of pest management, make sure you report that to the person above you. So just make a note of it. Write down what you found, what it looks like, what pest you think it is, and then start doing research on how to eradicate that pest, start coming up with options. So scouting for bugs is free. You walk the rows, you turn the leaves upside down, you look, you look low in the canopy, you look high in the canopy, you look around, feel free to pull a few leaves off. If you can't get a good look, reach in there, pop off a few leaves, look at those under your scope, see if you see anything. You should be scouting for pests on a regular basis with some sort of a strategy. Now, while you're out scouting for pests, you should check your yellow sticky cards. Every grow should have yellow sticky cards and they should be checked frequently and change frequently as well. Yellow sticky cards are exactly what I'm saying. They're little yellow cards. They're about four inches by four inches or maybe four inches by six inches and they are bright yellow and they are sticky. They've got a disgusting glue on them that if you touch it, it's going to take all day to get that stuff off of you. Don't get one stuck to your elbow when you're working in the grow. If you've done it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you do it, you'll go, ah, oh, that's what he meant. But you should have yellow sticky traps all over the grow. I like to put yellow sticky traps low down by the soil so that if I get any soil bound pests coming up out of the dirt, I get indicators of that. I like to put yellow sticky traps low in the canopy. So if I get any low flying stuff, I get indicators of that. 
I'll put stuff at the top of the canopy, and then I'll also put stuff up near the light so that if anything flies into it, I get an indicator of that. And that is a really easy way to find out that you have got insects. Bugs love those yellow sticky traps. They say, wow, look how bright that is. That's a leaf that is weak. That's a leaf that's got a weak surface that I can get in there and really start sucking the juice out of without a lot of effort. I want to go to that. So the bugs run to that yellow sticky trap and they go, oh shit, this is yellow sticky trap. I'm stuck here. And then we come in in the morning and we get to find out what kind of bugs were messing around in the garden, having a party while we were at home trying to get some rest. Yellow sticky traps are really affordable and they are a really early indicator of the presence of pests. So hang up your sticky traps, check them on a daily basis. If you start seeing things stuck to them, investigate what that pest is and treat accordingly. Then hang up fresh sticky traps and see if that problem has gone away or if it has gotten worse or if anything new pops up. But if you're going to use the yellow sticky traps, there has to be some sort of method to your madness. You have to hang them strategically, you have to check them, and you have to replace them. And if you see something, you have to react accordingly. So now we have two methods of finding bugs in our garden. We can use our own vision from scouting, and then we can use yellow sticky traps to assist us. Our next step is to learn to use our integrated pest management system to continue to prevent infestations and we also need to learn what to do if a pest infestation should occur. In a strategic pest management system, it's always wise to have preventative measures in place. Why wait until we've got bugs to start treating for bugs? Let's make it uncomfortable and undesirable for the pests we know may arrive. Now, before we talk about options, let's talk a little bit about ethics. You can choose predator bugs. You can choose organic sprays. You can choose harsh chemical sprays. Whatever you choose to treat your garden is up to you. I encourage you to use something safe. Is it safe to you? Is it safe to the consumer? Is it safe to your pets? And is it overall safe to our environment? If you're going to smoke it yourself, spray whatever you are comfortable with spraying on your garden. That's yours. You can do whatever you want. I probably don't want to smoke it if you sprayed it with a few things, but if it's yours and you're sure it's not going anywhere, you can treat it however you are comfortable. If you have other consumers that are going to consume your product, keep their health and safety in mind. Not everybody is a young, healthy person. Some people may have underlying health issues that may be exacerbated by a pesticide or an essential oil or a botanical oil. Keep other people in mind if you are going to share, sell, or dispense your product in any sort of way. Then, of course, please make sure that your pest management system is environmentally friendly. We also need to keep in mind the long-term effects of whatever we choose to use. Beneficial mites will have a long-term environmental effect, but it is a much gentler effect than if we went outside and sprayed harsh chemicals. So think about long-term. Think about exposure, not just to the plants, the environment, the soil, your neighbor's gardens, but also to yourself. You've got to apply those chemicals or pesticides or botanical oils. Think about if they're going to harm you over time. Also think about, this is something we don't think about often enough here that I'm trying to gear myself more toward. Think about the ethics of the company that makes the products you are using. Does that company care? Do they care about the environment? Do they care about people? Do they care about cannabis? Are they opposed to cannabis? There are some companies out there that make products that are available at the hydro store that are completely opposed to cannabis and cannabis legalization. Why would we buy those products to support those people? So when it comes to selecting a pesticide, understand the company, understand the product you're buying, understand the active ingredient, and understand the effects of that ingredient in the long term. Understand what it's doing to yourself understand what it's doing to your consumers, and try to understand what it does to the environment. And then really think about if that's something you can support, if that is something you would be proud to say you did, if that is something you would stand behind. And if you're proud of it, if you can support it and you'd put your signature on it, go ahead and use that product. Do what you're comfortable with. So now let's talk a little bit more about preventative. That's where I was headed with all of that. Preventative measures. It's okay to start treating for a pest problem before you see a pest problem. Why wouldn't we go ahead and make an undesirable environment? What are easy ways to do that? An easy way to do that is to already apply beneficial insects. Why not start a colony of beneficial bugs in our garden before the bad bugs even have a chance to take hold? You can start getting your persimilis, your swarskis, whatever you decide to use in there. Do a little bit of research. Make sure that you order the proper bugs that work for your environment. Your temperature and humidity will 
play a huge factor in the bugs that you need to order. But get some predators in there. Get the army established and get them started before the bad guys can even get started. So another route you can take is by spraying pesticide applications. You can use your essential oils, your botanical oils, or you can use your light or heavy chemical sprays, whatever you choose to use. You can start applying them before you see an insect infestation. That way, if a bug does try to creep down the ducting, it jumps on the plant and it goes, oh, fuck that. I don't want to be here at all. And it just tries to run. It doesn't invite its friends. You can create that undesirable environment before you even get an infestation. I would start with a schedule and a strategy. Decide that you're going to spray every so often and then decide that you need to rotate your products this frequently and then set a schedule and a routine. And then if you see anything, you can step up your game accordingly. We'll talk more about scheduling and strategy a little later. Now, let's say we have been scouting and we have been doing our preventative sprays and now we have discovered some pests. Now, how do we treat them? What's the first step? The first step is to correctly identify your pest. On a commercial scale, it would save a lot of time and energy to treat for the correct pest the first time. So the first step is to correctly identify our pest. The next step is to think about how do we want to treat this problem? Do we want to use predators? Do we want to use horticultural oils? Do we want to use botanical sprays? Do we want to get in there with essential oils? Or do we want to step up our game and start using light pesticides or maybe even stronger pesticides? This is where we have to think about that. A lot of the essential oils and the hippie products aren't going to get rid of a strong infestation. That's where you'll need to step up to a mild pesticide. A lot of the pesticides are organic. A lot of those will work for you. If you've got a serious infestation and you don't want to deal with some organic stuff, you can step your way up to more harsh chemicals. But like I said, those are toxic and they become dangerous and you need to think about the ethics of what you are giving to other people. Now, if you're trying to stay more organic, if you're doing a TLO sort of setup, you can introduce predator bugs. Predators are expensive. You also have to have specific insects to battle specific insects. You can't just release one thing and expect it to go take care of any bug that you may get. So predators are an option. They're also time consuming. You have to get out there and let them go. You have to apply. They either come in sachets or they come in a bottle with like a little spout. You got to let them out somehow. They have to be dispersed through the garden. So they are time consuming, but they are organic. They are 100% organic. You're not applying anything to the garden that's going to change the flavor. You're not putting any chemicals on there that may make anybody else sick and they are completely safe. So you found a pest, you identified the pest, you've done some research on products that will help you get rid of that pest, either beneficial bugs or pesticide sprays, and now you've decided to apply that product. Now keep in mind, if we apply the same product to a pest too many times, those bugs will develop a resistance. So you'll see a bug, you'll treat it, it'll look like it's gone, it'll come back, you'll spray for that bug again, you'll think it's gone, a couple weeks later, it'll come back, you'll spray twice as hard, It'll come back and it won't show up for a long time. When it does come back, you won't be able to spray it down with the product you've been using before. You'll have to switch it up. So to prevent that, I recommend using multiple modes of attack. And don't forget that if the pesticides work together and don't cause a chemical problem together and don't disrupt the plant health, you can mix more than one pesticide in a tank together. I've done an episode about it titled Tank Mix. Don't be afraid to mix multiple products together. So you mix your products, you give it a good shake, you apply to your plants. I would say give it two or three days, then apply a different mix. Then if you still see the presence of bugs, apply a different mix. Don't go at it with the same product over and over because they will develop a resistance to it. Earlier, I said we would talk about scheduling and strategy. So let's talk about a more scheduled and detailed integrated pest management strategy. Here is a quick rundown of my scheduling and my strategy for pest management in a grow. Now, everything I mentioned is approved by the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division and also the Colorado Department of Ag. I cannot apply a pesticide that is on the banned list or that has not been approved for use in a commercial grow. So everything I'm using is approved by the state of Colorado. Now, to start my pest management system, every Monday... I apply a specific pesticide regimen to all of my vegetative plants, my small veg, my large veg, my mother plants, and the clones that are rooted and in pots. They all get sprayed with a pesticide. Depending on the size of the plant, I may spray them with a little more potent mix. I may spray them with a lighter mix. I may spray with just one product. I may mix up multiple products at a time. But every Monday, those plants are getting treated. 
I also write down exactly what I sprayed on each plant. That way, next week, I know I can switch my pesticide. I can spray something different next week to prevent a resistance. Now I know that my plants have got a protective barrier. There's a little protection going on to prevent from getting pests in the room. If you're using lighter sprays, if you're using botanical oils or essential oils, you may want to up your spray regimen to twice a week. If those things don't stick around very long, you may want to apply them more frequently. So have a weekly spray schedule in place and try to switch up your products so that you can prevent your pests from building any type of resistance. Now, when you're in there applying the sprays, spray the undersides of the leaves. You'll notice the spider mites are on the underside of the leaves. Why not spray there? So start at the bottom of the plant and start spraying the underside of the leaf and work your way up the plant to the top and you will saturate the entire grow this way. Try to cover all of the plants just to the point of runoff, right to when they start dripping. Specific products will have specific guidelines, but I recommend you spray right to where they start running off. You just want to saturate that plant. Don't leave any desirable space for a pest. So get in there and spray once, maybe twice a week. And you can do this throughout the vegetative stage. Now, once we start approaching the flower phase, we need to think about what we are going to do for pest management during the bloom phase. In a typical commercial grow, I would generally apply approved pesticides until day 14 or 15 of the flowering phase. I may go in there the first day of the third week and hit that room one last time if I've had any problems, just to make sure those bugs aren't coming back. If you don't have any buds building yet, if you're just starting to get bud set, you should be okay with one final spray if you are selective with your products. Now, if you haven't seen any bugs, you can taper off your spray applications earlier in flower, and that's when we can start to introduce our beneficial and predator insects. Now, the beneficial insects work just like pesticide applications. You have to reapply them at specified intervals. Most of the vendors that provide live bugs are willing to set you up on a schedule to where you will receive the same order every week. That way, you can rely on it coming. It'll show up at the grow. You'll say, hey, look, they're here. And then you've got to hang them because they're right there in your face. You can't forget. You can't put it off. They're alive. So that's a good way to get yourself on a good regimen and a good schedule of getting the live bugs out. So in a commercial grow, we basically work with spray applications until we see bud set. That's when we switch to the predator bugs. Make sure to taper off your spray application to where it doesn't destroy your predator bugs. Now, if you've been releasing your predators on your schedule and you start seeing spider mites, you can order fast release predators that will get in there and eat those spider mites for you. They come in a bottle with a little spout and they are hungry. You turn the spout, you open that bottle, you point that bottle at a leaf and the spider mite, the predator mites that are in there start marching out. They go and destroy the spider mite colonies. So if you start seeing an infestation during flower and you're already putting out the bugs, you just need to step up the bugs and try to ride it out through flower. You can defoliate, take any spider mite infested leaves out of there, get them out of the room. Don't go into a different room after that. Don't drag the bugs from the dirty room to the clean room on your clothes. Try to start the day working in the clean room and then work your way through to the dirtiest rooms and try to work on the bug infested room very last if that is an option. So if you've done everything correctly, you won't see spider mites late in flower. But if you do and you're using beneficial insects, you've got the option to apply more beneficial insects. I don't recommend spraying flowering plants with anything. Once you have bud set, everything you spray on there, you will taste it. If not in the flower, you will taste it in the concentrates. So if you do notice a presence of bugs late in flower in your flowering room and you were using beneficial insects as your pest management system, or if you're using sprays as your pest management system, it is time to step your game up in your vegetative areas. We need to eliminate the pests in veg because if you've got them in flower, they are in veg. And we need to start getting rid of them and having a clean grow before we move stuff into the flower room. Because like I've mentioned, once we get past week three, we can't really spray those plants. We can only treat them with bugs and that takes time to build up. So let's focus on getting the plants clean and pest free before we even move them to that stage. A lot of people try to focus on the flowering plants. They want to get those pest free. Those are on their way out. Let's focus on the moms. Let's go all the way to the beginning and get the mother plants very clean. Let's get the source material clean. Let's work on keeping the clones clean. Let's learn how to get the veg room immaculate. So that way, when we move into the flower room, we don't have to battle bugs. We don't have to battle pests. We can focus on building those fat, juicy buds and delicious trichomes that we're all after.
Now, one thing I do recommend is write down all of your sprays. If you were working in a commercial grow, you were required to write down all of your sprays. You have to write down the date, the time. You also have to write down the name of every product and the EPA number of every product and the amount of every product that you applied. You have to write down the REI of each product that you applied. You have to write down the lot number of plants. There's a lot of documenting to be done in a commercial grow. I recommend you do the same thing in your private grow. Just for peace of mind, it's always nice to have records. And if you do end up working in a commercial grow, you've already got experience writing down what you've been using. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of people that will not agree with my pesticide spray application regimen. That is just fine with me. I like that people have different opinions. That's just the method that I use in a commercial environment. It's what has been proven to work for me. It has been proven to be cost effective, and it is something that I can train other employees to do on a repeatable basis. Just like all other aspects of growing cannabis, the options for integrated pest management are endless. And as long as it's making you happy, as long as you are satisfied with the results, keep doing it. All right, podcast world, that is my quick talk on integrated pest management. I know I didn't recommend any products. I didn't recommend any specific vendors. I did not recommend any brands. My goal was to give you an idea of how to start your own custom-tailored integrated pest management. Now you know what to expect, and you've got a few options on how to prevent and how to treat those things. Now you can customize that program to work for your grow, your budget, and your style. If you've got any questions or comments about this podcast, I would love to hear from you. My email address is at hotmail.com. If you feel like this podcast was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to contribute to the show financially, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash growfromyourheart. All of the information you need to become a patron will be right there. Ladies and gentlemen, I made it 35 minutes without taking a break. My voice is burning out. I want to thank you for hanging out for this long episode. I'll be back Monday with a fresh new episode. I want to give a huge shout out to Stabby McStabberson. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's time for episode 360 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at dankseed.store. You guys know I like to start the show off by letting you know what I'm smoking. Today, I'm taking dabs of Bubble Jack FSE from Fuego Extracts. I really love the flavor of this stuff. It tastes like bubble gum. The flavor just lingers on my tongue. I really like it. There's a little information printed on the side of the package here. It's got a lab test that says 71.83% max THC, 2.85% CBGA, and it's got 9.98% terpenes. I really enjoy this concentrate. That bubble gum, cotton candy flavor that just lingers on the tongue is perfect. And then that head high that goes straight to the brain and keeps you rambling, keeps you motivated is perfect. So a big two thumbs up to the Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract from Fuego Extracts. I really do enjoy smoking this. All right, you guys, let's keep moving this show forward because I have got a lot to talk about. We're going to get back into the grow lessons on this episode. This is going to be the eighth lesson in a long series of grow lessons. So far, we've talked about our goals and ideas and where to set up our grow. We've gone over the equipment. We've talked about the lights. We've talked about our containers. We've talked about soil and medium. We've talked about pest control. And if you're not caught up, I recommend you go back to episode 351 and start there. There are a couple of interruptions in the lessons. I will sneak in a few episodes that are not grow lessons while I'm doing this series. Sometimes I'll need to read emails. Sometimes I'll need to answer questions. Coming up, we're going to have some iTunes customer reviews. Things like that will disrupt the lessons, but I think it keeps the shows fresh. It keeps me motivated and it keeps it fun. But in this episode, we will continue the grow lessons. But before we get there, let's talk about a couple of things I kind of overlooked while we were talking about building our grow. It might be a good idea to add a smoke detector to each grow room. Wherever you've got a grow light hanging, have a smoke detector in that room. Also, I would recommend a fire extinguisher outside of each grow room. Now, I hope you don't have to use it, but if that smoke alarm goes off, you'd rather have that fire extinguisher outside of the grow room so you don't have to open the door, run in there, get the fire extinguisher, then start working on the fire. If it's outside of the grow room, you can just grab it. You can be a little more prepared. You can get in there. You can start putting out the fire. Also, if you've never used a fire extinguisher, maybe read the instructions. Maybe understand what to do in case of a fire. 
Maybe just read that little book that comes with it. And also make sure it stays charged. It's got a gauge on it. It's got a red, a yellow, and a green. Make sure your little arrow is in the green at all times. You might want to think about some sort of automated fire suppression system. They make things that hang in the middle of the grow room. It's got a little heat sensor in it. If it gets too hot, it basically explodes. It releases a powder that rains down into the grow room that will put out any fire that's in the room. Think about some sort of way to detect and suppress a fire in your grow room should that situation occur. Another thing I overlooked when we were designing and building our room was an automated watering or an assisted watering system. An automated watering system can really speed things up once you get into a larger grow. It also makes the plants really happy because the plants love consistency. If you're interested in designing an auto watering system, I did a full episode about auto watering on episode 335. Unfortunately, there were some audio technical difficulties and parts of the episode chop out. If you listen to that episode and you still have specific questions, send me an email at growfromyourheart@hotmail.com and we will get your auto water system dialed in. All right, so at this point, we should have goals and reasonable expectations for our grow. We should have a good idea of where we want to put the grow. We should have a good idea of the gear we want to buy, the lights, the pots, the medium. We should also have a good idea of pest control. Now we've talked a little bit about fire suppression. I've also done an in-depth episode on fire suppression. That is episode 260. If you want to learn a lot about fire safety in your grow, episode number 260 will teach you a lot there. If you decide you want to add an auto watering system to your grow, episode 335 is the episode all about auto watering. So that should get us all caught up. The room is ready. We've got the gear planned out. We've got a good idea of pest management. We know what we're going to feed the plants. We know how to take care of a fire. We know how to set up an auto watering system if we need one. Now we're getting to the fun part of this journey. Let's start thinking about plants. What do you want to grow? What do you want to dedicate your time, your energy, your space, and a bunch of money to over the next 90 to 120 days? What strains have gotten your attention? What strains do you really enjoy smoking? Does something work for you medically? Does something work for you recreationally? Is there something that is reliable that every time you smoke it, you get the desired effect? This is going to fall back to the very first episode of this Grow Lesson series. Are you growing this for yourself? Are you growing it for a medical patient? You have a lot of things to think about when it comes to deciding what strains to grow in your new garden. In legal, medical, and recreational states, we have a lot more options for acquiring genetic material. We can go to a dispensary and buy a clone off of the shelf. We can go to our friend's garden and ask them for clones, and they can give, sell, or trade those clones to us. We can acquire clones here very easily in Colorado. In fact, I went to a dispensary just a few days ago to pick up these Fuego extracts, and they had two different variety of clones on the shelf that looked very healthy. They had Purple Punch and Dosey Dose on the shelf ready to go at a very reasonable price. So clones are readily available in Colorado. Seeds are also available in some Colorado dispensaries. You can walk right into the store, you can grab a pack of seeds, and you can start your new garden from seeds you picked up at your local dispensary. Clones and seeds are both viable options for starting a garden. This episode is going to focus on the great debate on seeds versus clones. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about how you can decide what strain you want to grow. The best way to do that is to smoke a bunch of different strains. Now, if you're in a medical or recreational state, that is a lot easier than if you were in prohibition land. If you're in prohibition land, who knows if the strain you are buying is even really what whoever is selling it to you is called. They're probably growing something and they're calling everything cookies because cookies sells. Anything with the letters OG at the end of it sell. So you've probably got something cookies OG. Uh, anything with the word fire in there works well. So you probably... You guys are probably buying fire cookies OG in Prohibition land everywhere, and it's probably whatever that person got a clone of or whatever that person's buying bulk of, and they're just renaming it because they know that names are hot. So in a Prohibition state, it's going to be a little bit harder. Maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe you'll get a seed in your bag of weed one day. You can always grow out those bag seeds. Sometimes you find phenotypes very close to what you started with. Also, sometimes you find hermaphrodites and problematic plants, so be prepared for that as well but sometimes it is your only option. It's always an awkward situation asking a grower for clones. If you're a new grower and you're buying herb from somebody and you're like, bro, I really love this strain. Do you think I could get a clone? That always presents an awkward situation. First of all, now you both know you're growing. If you're in a prohibition state, that makes things really weird for both of you. 
Also, that guy doesn't want to release his genetics to you because now he's going to lose a customer. So unless you're on a really friendly basis with your weed guy, I would avoid that conversation. Now, in a legal state, in a recreational or a medical state, it's really easy to go find out what strains work best for you. You go to the dispensary and you buy as many grams as you can afford of different varieties and you go home and you smoke them. You start fresh every day and you try this strain. I haven't smoked this one yet. Let's smoke strain A and you take a few notes and you see how it works for you first thing in the morning. If you've got a target, if you're trying to make your leg pain go away, if you're trying to make your headache go away, if you're trying to make your back pain go away, if you're trying to make your anxiety go away, document the level of which that ailment starts. Is it a five? Is that at a 10? Okay. I started off with a level five leg pain. I smoked a bowl of this strain A. I know my leg pain is at a two. Document that. The next day I woke up, leg pain's at a five. I smoked strain B. Now my leg pain is still at a five. I obviously don't want to buy any more of this shit. Then you want to go the next day. Day number three, I woke up, my leg pain's at a six. I smoked some of this. Now I'm at a two this one might work well for me. Let's put a little star by that and remember what this is. And then just keep doing little tests like that on yourself and with the flowers and find out what strain works for you. If you find a strain at one dispensary that works very well for you, try to find it at another dispensary and smoke that product because they have different growers. They may have different clones. Their product is going to come out very different in the end. Even if we start with the same clone, Two commercial grows will produce two very different products. So try them both and see if it's the strain. It might have just been that one batch. It might have just been that one grow. But try different batches if possible. I know it sounds like I'm completely spoiled, but this is a real thing. I can drive to 10 dispensaries in my area and probably five of them have wedding cake. And that wedding cake was probably grown by three different grows. And I bet you if I try all three of them, they're all going to have very subtle nuances. One will taste a little different. One's going to burn a little different and one's going to have a better high, but they're all going to have that wedding cake, droopy eye, giggly kind of thing going on. So try to check them out from different grows if you can. Make sure that it's the strain and not just that one grower that did it for you. Now, one thing I want to loop back on, we talked about trying to get a clone from your grower. If you do try to buy a clone from your grower friend, don't be offended when he hits you with a really steep price. Think about this. He's been selling you herb for how long? And now you're going to grow your own? How much money are you taking out of his pocket? I know you're going to save that much money, but that guy's been relying on you as a customer. And now you're going to try to grow your own. He's going to go, dude, this guy's gone. You've got to put a fat chunk in his pocket as a parting gift when he gives you that clone. That's why he needs so much for it. Also, he's the only one growing that in town. That's how he's living. That's how he's making his income. You're going to bite into that. That genetic is going to be out there. How does he know you're not going to run a bunch of it and flood the town with it? So when they hit you with a really high price for a clone in a prohibition state, that's why. It's because that's how that person is living. That is his income. That's his artwork. He's probably pheno hunted that or he paid a whole lot of money for that clone himself. So he's sharing his revenue stream with you and kind of opening up the floodgates to put himself out of business. Once you guys do a pheno hunt and you found your own keeper, you'll kind of understand a little bit more, especially in a prohibition state. All right, you guys, we've talked a little bit about deciding what you want to grow. What you want to grow is up to you. Once you decide what you want to grow, if you pick something that takes 10 or 12 weeks and it grows tall and skinny, if that's really what you think you want to grow, you're going to have to adapt to that plant. Don't try to make that plant adapt to you. That is not how it works. All right, I've got a bunch of notes, but I don't have a good segue. So let's just jump right into this. Let's talk about the debate on seeds versus clones. You've decided what you want to grow. Now, do you want to grow it from seed or from clone? Growing from either seed or clone both have their advantages and disadvantages. Something you'll have to think about with both of them is availability. Are clones available where you are? Does somebody in your area grow that is willing to release clones to you for your personal production? Is there a dispensary in your area that sells clones? If I read correctly, in Canada, you can ship clones to each other through the mail. So that's an option. But if nobody has clones near you, they are not available. Now, if somebody does have clones, are they accurately labeled? Do they have the variety you're looking for? And are they clean? We'll talk about that in just a minute. It's kind of the same story with seeds. Do you know somebody that's got seeds that is willing to share some with you? And if you get them from somebody, Are they accurately labeled? And do they have the variety that you're looking for? 
One of the advantages of seeds is that there are shops on the internet that will send seeds directly to your mailbox. If you are in a prohibition state and you order seeds from an online vendor, it is your responsibility to keep those seeds in the packaging and do not allow them to grow if it is illegal to grow them in your area. Save them as souvenirs and collectibles until legalization happens in your area or until you move to a legalized state. But there are several online vendors who will send you seeds to keep as collectibles. If you do choose to germinate those and grow those yourself, that is your responsibility. Anything that happens from that is up to you. But seeds are available online and seeds don't die in the mail. Now, I want to do a friendly debate on clone versus seed. But to keep it fair, we need to act like there is a place where we can go that has clones and seeds available in just about any variety we could imagine. Think about the strain that you chose you want to grow for your first time. Let's imagine there's a dispensary where we can go and they've got flowers of that strain grown by three different growers so we can smoke it from three different people and make sure it's what we like. They've also got extracts there. So if you're into smoking concentrates, they've got full spectrum extract, they've got shatter, they've got wax, they've got whatever you're into that way. So you can make sure that's the strain you desire for your concentrates. Then also they have got seeds and clones of your favorite strain ready for you there. Now you've got the option. Do you want to buy seeds or clones for your grow? Let's start a friendly debate right here. Now, before I get too far into this, let me give a quick explanation on what a clone is. I'm pretty sure most people know what a seed is. That's a little bean that grows into a big plant. It came out of another plant. Now let's talk about a clone. A clone is basically a photocopy of a plant. We take a cutting off of a plant and it roots, and now we have a photocopy of the plant we started with. Cannabis plants are annuals, which means they only live for one year or one cycle. So we grow it from seed, it produces bud, we harvest it, it is over. By taking a clone, we can have that plant again and again, then we can have repeatable, reliable outcomes and a reliable product from each harvest. So a clone is basically a genetic photocopy of a reliable plant in the form of just a tiny little plant. And we'll talk about clones and we'll talk about pheno hunting a lot more as these grow lessons go on. Now let's talk about some of the pros and cons of seeds and clones. The pros of growing from seed. One of the best parts about growing from seed is there are no bugs and no pathogens. You don't get free powdery mildew with your new clone. All too often, people give out clones that are infested with spider mites, with russet mites, with aphids, with thrips, or with powdery mildew. That is not an option with a seed. So let's also put that in the cons category when it comes to growing from clone. One of the disadvantages of starting from clones is that they may come with bugs or pathogens. Now let's talk about one of my favorite parts about growing from seed. Growing from seed allows me to find custom tailored phenotypes that work perfectly for what I'm looking for medically and perfectly for what I'm looking for in my grow. It grows the height I want it to grow. It grows for as long as I want it to grow. And it gives me medicine that gives me the effect that I need. So growing from seed allows me to find something completely unique for myself that works perfectly for my garden and my medical needs. The con to that is it does take time for selection. I have to run the batch of seeds. I have to find the plant that works for me. Hopefully there was one in that batch that was exactly what I wanted. If not, I keep searching. So that is the downside to that. And we will do an episode on pheno hunting in the future that is lined up in this series. So one of the advantages is that I can find perfectly custom tailored phenotypes that work for myself and my grow. The con to that is that it does take time for selection. I have to run the seeds. I have to grow them up. I have to cut clones. I have to flower them out. I have to dry them, cure them, smoke them, and see which ones I enjoyed, see which ones I didn't enjoy. Usually when I run a 10-pack, I find two or three that I want to run again. So I'll repeat the process and eliminate it to one. But that does take time, money, and energy to get to that point. Also, there may be males, there may be hermaphrodites, and there may be undesirable phenotypes in that test run. So depending on the quality of the seeds and the experience of the breeder and the stability of the work, I may not find the phenotype I'm looking for in a 10-pack. It may take more than 10 seeds to find the desirable phenotype. But if I've got reliable seeds and the breeder did his work and I've done my job properly, I may find something in there that is amazing. 
and I may find something in there that nobody else has, which will set me apart from the market. If I'm growing for production to put on the street, having a very unique strain would set me apart from the market. If I've got the frostiest, dankest strain on the market, people are going to want to buy that first, which means I'm going to make more sales, which means maybe I can charge a little more. So having that perfectly selected phenotype that grows exactly the way I want it to, it grows perfectly for my grow and it works perfect for my area, for my market. That is a great advantage of growing from seed. Another advantage of growing from seed is that there is a huge variety available. I know we talked about this imaginary store where everything is available, but it's not like that in all places. There are seed banks online that make many varieties of seeds from very many reputable breeders available to people all over the world. So seed availability is a huge advantage. Not everybody can get their hands on clean, reliable, accurately labeled clones. So being able to order seeds from a seed bank is definitely advantageous. Now, the downside to that is seeds can be kind of expensive. Depending on the vendor and the breeder, seeds can have a huge markup. And if you're working with regular seeds, you may lose 60% of your crop right when you switch to flower because you're going to have male plants to deal with. So buying seeds can get expensive. And you also need to have a reliable breeder and a reputable vendor so that you know you are getting what you pay for. Now let's focus more on growing from clone. What are some of the advantages or pros of growing from a clone? If properly selected, that clone is a female. If properly selected, that clone is known to put out high potency and to grow without any issues. Now that being said, we have to rely on a grower. So that is one of the cons of growing from clones. Somebody has to grow the seeds and find the keeper plants out of those seed packages. Hopefully, they chose the stellar keeper to pass on as clones to the consumers. In a dispensary, what usually happens is I'll cut 120 clones for my next run. I only need 100 of them, so I actually send those 20 to the store so that I don't have to throw them away. We put them on a manifest, we send them to the store, and those are made available for shoppers in the retail store. So if you're buying a clone from a dispensary and it's accurately labeled, you're probably getting the same exact cut as they're growing and putting on the shelf. So you know that those clones have been properly pheno hunted. You know that those clones are proven females with proven potency and have proven themselves to be resistant to bugs and pathogens. So that's the advantage to growing from a clone. The disadvantage to that is who knows who selected that. If you're just getting it from some dude on Craigslist, who knows how discerning his eye was. Maybe his idea of amazing bud and your idea of amazing bud are two completely different things. So keep that in mind when working with a clone. Another advantage of working with a clone is we have an idea of what to expect. Like we said before, somebody pheno hunted this clone. They've grown it out a couple of times. They know that it's a female. They know that it's going to have high potency, either high CBD, high THC, or a beautiful ratio of both. We know what to expect. We also have an idea of what type of growth patterns to expect. Is it going to get real tall? Is it going to get real bushy? Is it going to stretch out real bad? Is it going to need a lot of water? We also have a good idea of how long it will take to finish because our friends and partners have probably grown this cut several times before they gave it to us. So the main advantage to growing from clone is that you've got a proven female. You don't have to worry about calling males. Every plant you put in there is a female. They've been tested for potency. They've been tested for vigor. They've been tested for resistance. We know what to expect. We know if we need sticks. We know if we need trellis. We know how often to water it. We know if we can overfeed it. We know if it likes a high or a low pH, and we already know how many days to let it flower. So that is a huge advantage from working with a clone. Also, you can always call the guy and say, hey, bro, this plant's doing something weird. Have you ever seen this strain do this? And he'll say, oh, yeah, man, I grew that like 10 times before I gave it to you. You probably just need more CalMag. So he's got some sort of history, some sort of experience with it, and he can help you diagnose a problem if one does arise. So that's a huge advantage of working with a clone. Let's talk about some of the disadvantages. The number one disadvantage, the number one con to bringing clones into your garden is most of the time they are infested with bugs and pathogens. Every grower likes to say, my grow is immaculate. There is not a single bug in my garden. Nine times out of 10, those guys are wrong. The guys that boast most about having the pest-free garden are the ones that don't know the pests are there. The guys that say, no, I've got a little bit of spider mites. They're the guys that are paying attention, that are actually checking, and they know that those bugs are there. They are there. So 
getting a clone, you're probably going to get some sort of a problem. Everybody also likes to say, my buddy wouldn't give me clones with pests on them. Yeah, he doesn't even know they're there. He didn't check. He's not paying enough attention. He's just trying to make $5 a clone by selling them to you. He didn't care if you get spider mites or not because you're going to need more clones in the future either way. So the downside to clones is they come with free bugs quite often. You get spider mites, you get free root aphids, you get free white flies, you get free fungus gnats. And if you're really lucky, sometimes you even get free powdery mildew with your new clones. Another disadvantage to growing from clone is everybody already has it. If you're just growing this strain for yourself, for your medical needs, or for a loved one's medical needs, and that strain works perfectly for you, that is great. But if you are growing for a market reason, and everybody has that strain, you're going to have to be a better grower than everybody else growing it to make your product stand out. Otherwise, you're just another guy selling weed on the black market. If you don't have a standout strain, you will blend in just like everybody else. So if you're growing the same clone that all of your competition is growing, you've really got to be the best grower. So that's one of the downsides to growing from clone is everybody's got it. And you guys, that's why some growers are tight with their genetics. That's why some guys won't let clones out because they're the only one growing that specific strain in that area. If you want that, you've got to go to them. They've always got some income because their product stands out. Now, another downside to working with clones is they can get expensive. And something in me says that you get what you pay for when it comes to clones. If you're going to Craigslist and paying 3 to $5 for a clone, you're going to get a 3 to $5 clone. It may be quality genetics. It may be what you're looking for, but how healthy is it? How good of a start did it get? How many bugs does it have? Clones can get expensive. The clones that I saw at the dispensary recently were in four by four cubes of cocoa. The clones were about six or eight inches tall. They looked super healthy. They were $40. If you're trying to buy six of those, that's going to add up really quickly. Can you throw down $240 every time you want to start a fresh grow? A package of seeds is way cheaper than that, but you have to do the work. You have to grow them. You have to find the males and you have to find the keeper. The advantage with clone is somebody has already done all of that work for you so they can charge you 40 bucks. So one of the disadvantages to growing from clone is that they are expensive. Unless you're getting them from a friend, they can add up in cost quite quickly. You guys, I've seen clones go from anywhere from five or 10 bucks. I saw those clones at the dispensary the other day. They had a purple punch and a dosi dose. They were $40 each. It is not uncommon for me to see a clone sell for the $500 to $1,000 range. And there are stories of certain cuts being sold for ten dollars to $25,000, depending on what strain we're talking about. There are rumors of astronomical numbers, but I don't know how much of that is true. But some of the people in the Bay have paid ridiculous prices for some of the OG Kushes and some of the more well-known strains that the rappers rap about. Some of the OG Kush and Cookie Crosses went for big money when they first hit the market. And people have built entire empires and businesses off of those cuts. So clones can get quite expensive quite quickly. Another disadvantage to clones is, are they available? Does anybody in your area have clones? Does anybody you trust have clones available? And if you do get clones, are they accurately labeled? Ask your friends what clones they have. Don't ask for a specific strain. Because if you ask for wedding cake, now your friend suddenly has wedding cake and he needs big money for it. If you ask what strains he's got available, he'll give you a list, select from there. Don't give them the option to invent a name or slap a label on something just because you're willing to throw some money their direction for that cut. So that is my quick debate on seed versus clone. We'll go over it really quickly again and recap. The pros of growing from seed, no bugs, no pests, no problems. You don't start off with somebody else's problems in your grow. Another advantage is that you can select perfectly selected phenotypes that work for you and your grow. Also, nobody else is going to have your phenotype, which will give you better market value. Some of the cons of growing from seed is that it takes time for selection. You have to grow them and find out what you've got, select a keeper, and then grow from there. You will also need to cull males and undesirable phenotypes. They're also a little bit expensive. Also, is the strain you want available in seed form? Some of the older stuff may not be available anymore because breeders are always evolving and creating new stock. Another thing you have to think about is, are the seeds accurately labeled? Are you being sold what you're paying for? Now, let's talk about clones really quickly again. The pros, you have got proven 
potent females. You know what you've got. You know what you're working with. You know what to expect. You know what to plan for. Some of the downsides to working with clones are you get those bugs, you get those pathogens, you get free problems. Also, everybody else in the area has it. Everybody else is already growing it. There's nothing different. There's nothing exciting about it unless it's custom for you. Also, are clones available? Can you even get clones? Do you trust the people you have to deal with to get them? And are they accurately labeled when you do get them? That is my quick, friendly, unbiased debate on seeds versus clones. Of course, being a breeder, I want you to buy seeds and I want you to buy them at dankseed.store. Then I want you to do a pheno hunt and find the one that works best for you. We will talk about pheno hunting in the future. We will also talk about cutting our own clones in the future. That way, once you've acquired clones or seeds, you can do a pheno hunt. You can select the keeper. Then we can cut clones off of that keeper and we can be self-sustainable and not have to acquire genetic material from other sources unless we decide to add something new to the grow. So we'll talk about pheno hunting. We'll talk about cloning. We'll talk about mother plants. I have done a long episode about what to expect from a seed pack. I think that would make great supplemental listening to this episode. If you are interested in hearing my episode about seed pack expectations, it is episode 245. I encourage you to go check that one out. If it's not available on iTunes and Stitcher, it is still available on YouTube. All of the episodes are always going to be archived on the YouTube channel. Just search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you can hear my voice starting to burn out, so I'm going to wrap up this episode. I would appreciate your support on Patreon. For more information, go to patreon.com slash heart. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash heart. I would appreciate your support there. I would also appreciate it if you find me on social media, on Facebook, simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. On Twitter, it's at GFYH podcast. And if you'd like to follow my personal Twitter account, it is at Rasta Jeff 420. Don't forget to check out my Instagram page. It's at Irie underscore genetics. Check out my cannabis photography and come join me in my Instagram live videos. Ladies and gentlemen, my throat is burned out. I want to thank you again for listening. I'll be back in just a couple of days with another fresh episode. I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Jim Murphy. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Hey, what's up, podcast world? It's time for episode 362 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company. And you can find them at Dank seed.store. I like to start these shows off by letting you know what I'm smoking. Today, I've been taking dabs of orange, Skittles, Ambrosia from Apothecary Farms. I really like this as my morning smoke. I'm recording earlier in the morning than I usually do, and this orange Skittles has that orange juice, orange candy sort of a taste. It's also got my head going pretty quickly, so it's a great way to start the day. I'm smoking the orange Skittles Fambrosia from Apothecary Farms. The only difference between the Ambrosia and the Fambrosia is the Ambrosia is a one gram jar when they put it in the four gram jar. That's when they call it the Fambrosia. That's for the fam. So the Orange Skittles Fambrosia, the potency says 73.7% THC, zero CBD, total cannabinoids, 84.6%. It's a great way to start the day. It's got an uplifting head high. It's got that amazing orange candy flavor to it. And it's got me nice and talkative and energized. So this should be a good podcast. This is going to be another grow lesson. In the last lesson, I talked about clones versus seeds. Now, in this episode, we're going to talk about regular seeds, feminized seeds, and autoflower seeds. Before we get into the seed talk, I want to give a few shout outs to a couple of our Patreon supporters. I want to give a huge shout out to Angel Burtis. How about a big shout out to Miles Porter, a super shout out to Jade, and an extra Viking shout out to Grimble the Druid. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all the support on Patreon. If you're not already a patron and you would like to learn how to become a patron, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash grow from your heart. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash grow from your heart. You can learn how to sign up. You can become a patron and I will give you a shout out on the next episode. All right, podcast world. This episode is going to be about regular seed, feminized seed, and autoflower seed and deciding what will be best for you and your new garden. A lot of people out there will have an opinion about feminized seeds. A lot of people out there will have an opinion about autoflower seeds. Don't let anybody stop you from growing what makes you happy. There's a reason why regular seeds exist. There's a reason why feminized seeds exist. There's a reason why autoflower seeds exist. 
There are applications for all of those types of seeds. Do what you love and don't let anybody out there stop you from growing from your heart. When we are shopping for seeds, we are thrown a lot of information. Some of it is very useful. Some of it is just fluff for advertising. Somewhere in that information, we should be able to tell if the seeds we are shopping for are regular, feminized, or autoflowering. That should be clearly noted somewhere in the description. If I don't see any sort of notation, I generally assume they are regular seeds. Now, that's a really good place to start. What do I mean by regular seed? By regular seed, I mean they were produced conventionally. They were made with a male plant and a female plant. So in that package of seeds, you will find males and females. They are also not autoflower, which means they are photo period. Now, let's talk briefly about photo period. Photo period means that a plant is triggered into its flowering stage by a light cycle. In nature, this light cycle is mostly dictated by your location in relation to the equator. Are you right on the equator? Are you far north or are you far south of the equator? Now, as the seasons change, as fall rolls around, regions on the equator will start experiencing longer nights and shorter days. Those longer nights and shorter days tell our plant, hey, winter is coming. You need to start producing your flowers so that you can reproduce before the end of the season. And that triggers the plant to go into flowering. That is its photo period. Indoors, most cannabis plants require about a 12-hour dark period to induce flower. Outdoors can be different because the sun puts off different spectrums that trigger the plants to go to sleep. As the sun sets, it puts off a red spectrum that tells that plant, hey, it's nighttime, and then it starts going to sleep. As the sun rises, it puts off a blue spectrum that tells the plant it's time to wake up. So you don't need the 12-12 outdoors. You can work closer to a 14-hour day and more of a 10-hour night outdoors because the sun tells the plants to go to sleep. But that is photo period. The plants work off the light cycle, and the light cycle works with nature outdoors. Indoors, we're controlling that with a timer. So that is basically photo period. If your seeds are marked regular seeds or if it says photo on the package, that indicates that those plants will be triggered to flower by reducing your light schedule to 12 hours on and 12 hours off. Now, regular seeds also indicates that there will be males and females in that package of seeds. If you're trying to grow a seedless crop, you will have to pay attention and keep the males out of the flowering room. Somewhere between 7 and 10 days, those plants will start showing their sex. You'll have to go through and pull out all of the males. If you leave one male plant in there for too long, it will pollinate and all of the plants around it will be seeded. And depending on how long you let that male go and how much pollen he released and how much wind flow and how much movement you have in that grow, you may seed the entire crop with just one male. So that is basically regular seed. They are regular seed. They were bred conventionally, traditionally with a male and a female plant. They are photosensitive, which means they will trigger into flower by reducing the lights to approximately 12 hours on and 12 hours off. Some plants will work one hour either direction. You could go 13 hours on, you could go 13 hours off, you could play with that, but we recommend 12-12 as the critical period. Also, you will find males and females in your regular seeds. If you're not looking to do any breeding, if you want to grow seedless cannabis, you do need to cull those males. So that's the only major downfall of regular seeds. When you buy a package of regular seeds, you've got about a 50-50 chance of getting males and females. It's hard to dictate what you get with regular seeds. Now, a lot of people don't want to waste the energy, the time, the space, or the money buying and growing seeds that could possibly be males and need to be removed from the garden. Now, that is where feminized seeds come into play. A lot of people have hatred toward feminized seeds because they are misinformed. A lot of people have hatred or a bias against feminized seeds because there were a few breeders back in the day that put out a batch of feminized seeds that were total shit, and a few people bought those, and it put a bad taste in their mouth, and those people spread that taste throughout the internet. And I understand, when you get a terrible product, you want to tell people, people believe you, I get that. But that was way back in the day. We have come a long way since then. We understand how to produce feminized seeds on a commercial scale, and there are a lot of breeders and producers out there putting out reliable, quality feminized seeds. When they are made properly, feminized seeds will produce plants that give you 99.9% .9 females. This is nature and science together, so there will be anomalies. You will find things that don't fall into the chart that we drew because that's how nature works. That's why we say 99.9%. .9 
If I do my job correctly, when I produce feminized seeds, you will get 99.9% female plants. I'll give you a brief explanation on how I make feminized seeds and how a lot of the leading feminized seed producers make their products. I create a solution of silver thiosulfate that is really easy to learn how to do. All of the instructions for that are readily available on the internet. You can make a silver thiosulfate solution from products that are easily attainable on the internet for less than $30. Get these products. I use product number one and product number two. I mix them into water. Then I mix the two things of water together. Now I've got my silver thiosulfate concentration. I dilute that. Each plant that I'm using requires a different dilution and application rate. There is a standard that I start with. The basic dilution that I recommend to start with would be a one to nine ratio of silver thiosulfate to water. So you've got nine parts water, one part of the silver thiosulfate concentrate mixed into there. Shake that up real well and apply that to the plant on the first day of flower and then apply it every three days for 21 days. So you're going to give the plant seven full applications and spray it until it drips and get the stalks. Don't just get the leaves, get in there and spray the stalks. And be careful when you're using the silver thiosulfate spray because it may turn some things purple. If you've got a white wall, uh, depending on what you're up against, whatever that hits, it could turn it purple, including your skin. So be careful, wear gloves, wear a mask when working with the silver thiosulfate solution. That is always my recommendation. So I take the silver thiosulfate solution that I have created, then I apply it, I mix it at a dilution of nine to one, nine parts uh, distilled water, one part silver thiosulfate uh, concentrate. Then I apply it to the plants every three days for 21 days. It gets 21 applications. Then usually around day 25 to 30, it starts putting out pollen. And that's when I start collecting the pollen. I put something, usually a piece of glass, just depends on where I am and what I'm working with. I put a piece of glass near the plant, collect some pollen as it naturally falls out, pick the male flowers out of there, gather that, let it dry. Then when it really starts getting dumping, that's when I'll move it right over by the girls and give it a good shake. And now we've just made feminized seeds. I've still got six or seven weeks of nourishing those seeds. But if I've done everything carefully and done everything correctly, I have created feminized seeds. And there should be no reason why those should be problematic unless I completely screw up the next six or seven weeks, which is very unlikely because all I've got to do is make sure the equipment functions, make sure everything stays on a 12-12 cycle. I've got to feed it properly. I know how to feed plants that are pregnant. I know how to produce quality seeds. I've got to defoliate properly, and I've also got to make sure to keep everything pest and problem-free, and I'm quite experienced at all of that so far, so there should be no problem. I also make sure to thoroughly test run every batch of seeds I make before they make it to market. I grow some out myself. I give a bunch out to my friends. I'm sure you guys see on Instagram, people have the new stuff. You're like, how do they get that? It's because they grew something of mine. I was impressed by it. I reached out to them and I said, hey, do you want to run my next batch? I need you to take good notes, take good photos, send it all back to me. And then I'll know if I want to release that line or not. So I have other people grow it. I grow it myself. We test it before it's put out to market. That way I know that you're receiving a quality product. I'm going to go off way on a side rant here that's not even written down. When I make a new strain, so let's just say I just pulled some seeds out of a plant last night. That's a brand new cross. Nobody's ever seen it. I've never seen it. I don't know what it's going to do. Before those seeds go anywhere, I'm going to throw a handful of them in a paper towel and germinate them. And then in 24 hours, I'm going to pop it open and I'm going to see how many have sprouted tails. And I'm going to make a note and I'm going to write down the ratio. However, out of 100, they sprouted tails or they did not sprout tails. Then I'll close it back up and I'll let the other ones keep going. And I'll see in 36 hours how many made tails and I'll take good notes. Then I'll put some of those, the ones that did sprout tails and look good, I'm going to put those into some cups of dirt and I'm going to grow them and I'm going to pay attention to them. And I'm going to keep a lot of notes. I'm going to veg them. I'm going to flower them. I'm going to grow them. I'm going to dry them, cure them, smoke them, make concentrates out of them, smoke the concentrates. We're at least 120 days from even knowing what that product tastes like, probably closer to 150 with the dry and cure phase in there. Then that is my first grow with it. If I approve, then I'll pass some seeds on to Grim. If Grimble grows it and it looks good in his garden, I'll spread it out to a few more people. If they grow it well, that's when I'll let it go to a vendor or for retail but I test the shit out of my feminized seeds and my regular seeds. So I stand behind my product. And honestly, every feminized seed that I produce sells. I can't keep feminized seeds in stock and I don't get any complaints on my feminized seed products. So that's how fems are made. That's how I make my fems. 
The advantage to feminized seeds is there are no males to remove from the garden. You know that every seed you plant will result in a harvested crop. You won't have to grow it long enough to sex it. You won't be wasting any time. That's advantageous for people who live in medical states or anybody who is limited by a plant count. So your feminized seeds are all going to be females. Now you would say, why would people grow photo period seeds when they can grow feminized seeds and guarantee that everything they grow makes it to harvest? Like I said, a lot of people have a bias against feminized seeds. Also, a lot of people like myself like finding the males. Breeding with females and reversed females and alpha females is a great practice, but I like working with a solid male plant. I've got a passion for conventional breeding. I do make feminized seeds, but I have more fun with conventional breeding. Another thing you may notice when you're shopping for seeds is that feminized seeds are about twice the price of regular seeds. So yes, you do get viable females that you can take to harvest, but that pack of seeds cost exactly twice as what a regular pack of seeds cost. Although you didn't have to waste the time, the space, the soil, the energy, and you didn't have to have that extra plant count to add to your numbers in your legal garden. So if the packaging says feminized seeds, that means that 99.9% of the plants that come out of that seed package will be females. Now, here's something that is kind of a side rant that I was talking to somebody on social media about that I want to include in a podcast. I'm just going to give it a couple of seconds. Uh, we talk about the flip. When we flip to flower, feminized and regular photo period seeds, we flip them to flower by changing the light cycle either from 24 on and zero off to 18 on and six off, or however you've got your light cycle set up, then you switch to 12 on and 12 off. You are now in flower. Or if you're going to follow the DJ short plan, you go 11 on, 13 off. That's a whole other podcast. Anyway, we flip to flower. That is day one of flower. Your seed package will give you an estimate of how long they need to flower, nine to 10 weeks, 60 to 70 days, whatever it says. The day you initiated that flip is day one. Not the day you see bud set, not the day you smell something, not the day the butterflies flew in and did their magic dance. The day you change that timer is day one of flower. That's how you keep track of that. That's what we are talking about when we indicated that on the seed package. Just wanted to add that side note. I'm not sure if that was even relevant, but there you go. A little bonus nugget for your brain. All right, now let's work into auto flowering seeds. Let's talk about auto flowers. What do I mean by an auto flowering seed? Earlier, I was talking about your location in relation to the equator. Most of us live in an area where we see seasonal changes, and we also see changes in day and nighttime. But keep in mind, there are parts of Russia and Alaska that will receive extreme stretches of daylight and nighttime without interruption. There are some points in Alaska when they will have full sunlight for 80 days in a row. They will not get a night for 80 solid days. Cannabis is an extraordinary plant and it has evolved. The cannabis that we are familiar with, which has evolved from these extreme conditions with no dark, is known as ruderalis. These ruderalis plants have evolved to flower without any dark period. After so many generations, they went, hey, it doesn't get dark. We need to do something about this. So through evolution, they started to flower without a dark period. A lot of those ruderalis plants have no desirable effect when smoked but they have a lot of desirable traits when grown. Some of them stay short, they stay squat, they bush out really nicely, and you don't have to change the light cycle to convince them to flower for you. So cannabis breeders got a hold of ruderalis plants and they bred them together. They bred our auto-flowering ruderalis to our high-potency cannabis plants and the offspring resulted in high-potency auto-flowering cannabis plants. Most of the autoflowering seeds available for most breeders now are feminized. So you'll get autoflowering seeds that are all girls, which is really advantageous. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. I should warn you that when you're looking at seeds and you see feminized seeds on there, also look to see if they say photo period or autoflower on there. Make sure they indicate that. If they don't, they are probably photo period. All of the autoflower guys like to let you know that you're working with autoflowers. They clearly indicate that on the package. And earlier, I mentioned that feminized seeds cost twice as much as regular. Uh, auto flowers generally cost twice as much as feminized. So you got your regular, then they're doubled, then they're even doubled again. So they will let you know if they're auto flowers. Just make sure you read the package when you're buying your seeds. It'll either say regular or feminized or auto flower. Just do a little research before you buy your seeds. Make sure you know what you're getting. Now, 
let's talk a little bit about how these autoflower seeds are useful. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you love my favorite example of these autoflowers in use. Several years ago, there was a very large grow discovered in a national forest not too far from here. And it was discovered that that grow was ran by a cartel. As the reports and pictures came out, they were saying that the cartel had three different stages of growth happening in their illegal grow area. Now, that really made me wonder how are they growing different stages outdoors because the sun dictates what our plants do. If they put them outside, they all went into flower at the same time. Then my brain went, dude, they're using autoflowers. So this large cartel would set a patch of autoflower plants. Then they would wait a few weeks and they would set another large patch of autoflower plants, wait a few weeks and set another large patch of autoflower plants to where eventually they had a perpetual cycle going to where they had people out there in this national forest, just camouflaged, hidden, growing a perpetual grow, packaging up and sending it to who knows where I have no idea where it was going, but they were producing quite a bit of cannabis out there by using autoflowers. They had a perpetual grow under the natural sun. They didn't have to veg and then flower. They could just throw the seeds out there. They would grow and do their thing. So that's one way where autoflower seeds were highly effective. Now let's scale that down a little bit. Let's say you've only got one grow space and you want to produce a perpetual grow. You don't have a veg room. You don't have a flower room. You can't go buy clones from a friend. You can't have a friend veg for you. The way you could run a small, self-sustainable, perpetual grow is with autoflower plants in one room. Fill up a quarter or half of the room with autoflowers. As soon as they start flowering, plant more autoflowers and put them in the same room. You'll have veg plants and flowering plants in the same room. You can't do that with photo period plants. So if you're limited on space, if you've only got one room, that's a really useful method and a really useful application for autoflowering plants. The major downside that I see to autoflowering plants is you always have to buy new seeds. You cannot clone an autoflowering plant. If you're growing with regular or feminized photo period seeds, you're always able to cut a clone. You can keep that clone as a mother. You can keep it perpetually. And then you can always clone off of that mother and you can keep that plant sustainable. With autoflowers, you're always going to be buying new seeds. And earlier I mentioned most of the autoflower companies are only putting out feminized. So you're not even able to breed your own autoflowers with males and females anymore. You're going to have to reverse one. And I have no experience doing that. All right, you guys, that is my breakdown on regular seeds, feminized seeds, and autoflowering seeds. The regular seeds are always photo period. I like them because we find males and females. I like breeding with the regular seeds. That's a lot of fun for me. The feminized seeds can be photo period or they can be autoflower. They are probably well marked on the packaging. Those are always going to be females if they were bred properly. I've done a whole nother podcast episode about marking feminized seeds with S or R1 generations. I encourage you to listen to that one. That one is episode 331 and it's titled Selfing and Reversals. You'll learn a lot about why we label the packages the way we do. Also, I recommend you listen to an episode called Seed Pack Expectations and that is number 245. There's a lot of useful information in that episode for anyone who's considering purchasing new seeds. Then we'll keep it moving. We talked about autoflowering seeds. Autoflowering plants are unique to photo period plants because they flower based on their size or their age. We can put them under the veg lights. We can have them in the 18-6 room and they will still flower and they will still produce buds. A lot of autoflowering plants boast that they will be completely done around 10 weeks. So that's 70 days of a full cycle with a photo period plant. You've got closer to 120 days if you want usable product. So that is my lesson on regular feminized and autoflowering seeds. I hope I made your decision easier when it comes time to go shopping. Don't be afraid to try regular seeds. Don't be afraid to try feminized seeds. And don't be afraid to try autoflower seeds. You just may fall in love with something you never thought you would even like. And don't forget, you can find your seeds at dankseed.store. We're working on a Black Friday sale, you guys. This should get interesting. You guys, I've only been going for about 22 minutes, but honestly, my recording gear has been giving me a couple of technical issues and my throat is obviously burning out. So I'm going to wrap this up while I've still got a quality podcast on the screen. I don't want to lose any of the stuff I recorded. So please do support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash grow from your heart. Stalk me on all of the social media on Facebook. It's the grow from your heart podcast on Twitter. It's at GFYH podcast on Twitter. I use the other company. It's Irie underscore genetics. Also, you can email me grow from your heart at hotmail.com. Don't forget about the YouTube channel. Simply search for the grow from your heart podcast on YouTube. 
Click subscribe, watch the videos, leave some comments. I would appreciate your support there. You guys know I'll be back in just a few days with a fresh new episode. I'll get all the equipment fixed up so I quit getting glitches in the recording gear and I don't have to wrap up the end so quickly. I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Roger. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Welcome to the show, cannabis community. It's time for episode 363 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new regular or feminized seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at dankseed.store. I like to start the episodes off by letting you know what I'm smoking. I just finished the last dab of the Orange Skittles Ambrosia that left a nice orange flavor in my mouth, gave me a nice head buzz. I followed that up with the last dab of the Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract from Fuego Extracts. That was delicious. The combo made me super rambly and gave me a lot of energy. So this will be a fun podcast. If you've been following along, you know I'm doing a long series of grow lessons. If you haven't been following along, I suggest you go back to episode 351 and start there and get caught up. That will give you a solid foundation on planning your grow and getting prepared for your new grow. If you've been following along, you know that we've selected our space. We've selected our equipment. We've done a lot of talk about genetics. And now this episode is going to be about sprouting our new seeds. Let's not waste too much time. Let's jump right into it. Seeds can be expensive depending on who you ordered them from, how many you bought, what kind you purchased. You may have spent a lot of money on seeds. Before you think about germinating your new seeds, I highly recommend you have your veg area ready to rock before you even think about starting your seeds. You're going to think, oh, I can just germinate these seeds and then I'll build up this veg room in the next couple of days. And then while they veg, I'll work on the flower room. Once you get plants going, you start time traveling. Things go so much more quickly than you anticipate. Things pop up, things get in your way, then you fall behind. Then those seeds you just paid a bunch of money for start growing funky, they get out of control, and you've got shitty plants to start with and you're frustrated from the beginning. So before you germinate your seeds, have your veg space prepared. That is my very first piece of advice to you that will save you a lot of frustration. Now, my second piece of advice is to start with quality seed. Try to get your seeds from a reputable vendor and also from a reputable breeder. Don't fall for hype when you're shopping for seeds. Don't be sold. Try to find somebody with a good reputation, somebody that you have heard of, and also try to buy those seeds from a vendor with a good reputation, somebody that you have heard of, somebody that has a good relationship with the breeders. And if you're going to buy seeds online, I recommend you buy from a seed vendor in the United States. That way you don't have to risk customs. Of course, I recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company. I also recommend the Seed Bazaar. And I can also vouch for Southern Oregon Seeds. Those are three quality seed vendors that I trust and respect, and I work with them personally, so I know they will take good care of you. I'm not bashing any other seed company. I'm just saying I rely on these three companies. I have worked with them. I've got a relationship with them, and I know they are rock solid. So I recommend you start with a quality seed, something you know what the parents of that seed were, something you know where it came from. If you don't have access to fancy labeled expensive seeds, grow what you've got. In an ideal world, we would all go to the store and we'd look at the shelf and we'd say, you've got that strain. That was the best I've ever smoked. I want seeds of that. And I get that that's everybody's fantasy. That day is coming. Unfortunately, we are not there yet for everybody. Some people are going to have to be resourceful. You may have bought a bag of weed 10 years ago at some random place and it had seeds in it. Now you're going to have to grow those seeds. You never know what you're going to get out of those seeds. You could find duds. You could find hermaphrodites. You may find the next magical strain in there. So grow what you've got. No matter where your seeds come from, whether they're regular, whether they're feminized seeds, pay close attention to them, pay attention for males, pay attention for hermaphrodism, pay attention for problems. You will have to keep an eye out when you're growing from seed. Now, if you've got a bag of seeds lying around and you don't know what any of them are, it's just a perhaps a sandwich bag or a little mason jar just stuffed with random seeds from bags of cannabis you've gone through over time and you can't decide what to grow, I go for the really healthy looking seeds. And by healthy, I mean probably darker probably bigger. A lot of people like the tiger stripes. That's always a good sign. Some seeds will not make tiger stripes no matter how long they grow, no matter how mature, no matter how healthy and strong they are. They just won't stripe up. That's just a genetic thing. I prefer the darker colored seeds, the harder seeds. I give them a little press on the table. I hope they don't crack. If they don't crack, that's probably a good seed. If it cracks, it obviously isn't going to grow. That's a dead seed. 
A lot of people like a larger cannabis seed, but I've noticed that a lot of strains produce little tiny seeds. So sometimes a little tiny cannabis seed can produce a seriously potent plant. Don't judge it too much by the size. Judge it more by the health of the seed. A lot of the grayer, light-colored seeds will grow. I don't put those in my packs because people freak out. I grow those myself. But those lighter gray, the paler colored seeds, those will grow. The white seeds, those are more questionable. I don't think the white seeds do as well. The gray kind of silver sheeny seeds, those usually have a good takeoff. The darker ones, those take off quite quickly. And then, of course, you get those bigger, harder tiger stripe seeds. Those really have a lot of vigor and they take off really quickly for you. So seed health is important, selecting healthy seeds. If you've got a big bag of seeds, try to select the healthiest looking beans out of that bag. Maybe a couple of them just call you. Maybe you've got a bag of a thousand seeds and two of them just go, hey, bro, I'm the seeds you want to grow right now. Listen to that kind of stuff. That is usually accurate. All right, now we've got our veg space ready. We know what to look for in quality seeds. We've got some seeds on hand and it is time to germinate our seeds. What do I mean by germinate? That's just a fancy word for starting the seeds. We need to give them the proper conditions to make them start. We want to crack the seed open. We don't want to do it. We want it to happen naturally. We want the seed to crack itself open and we want a little tiny taproot to come fishing out and that is the start of life. In nature, those seeds would fall out of last year's bud. Winter would come. It would knock those seeds out. Those, the buds would dry. The wind and the moisture would knock those seeds out of those buds. Those buds would fall into the ground. Winter would come and everything would be frozen for a little while. As the spring came and the winter frost or the winter moisture started mo moistening down into the soil, those seeds would begin to receive moisture and warmth from nature. That would trigger them to germinate. Then they would sprout up. They would find their way up, dig up out of the soil. They'd start seeing sun and they'd go, here I am. And then they would live and they would become little baby cannabis plants. Now, with human involvement, what we've done, we have collected the seeds before they fall out of the buds. When I breed, I let the plants get done. I let the seeds get finished. I cut the plants down. I let them hang. They dry. Then I basically crumble up the buds and I manually remove the seeds. There are several methods of doing that. That's not important right now, but that process happened. Then those seeds were passed on to you. Now, you have to play the role of Mother Nature. We have to give these seeds the proper environment to trigger them to start their life. The two main things that are going to start our seeds are water and warmth. The main thing being water, warmth, very secondary to that. Warmth will speed up the process and make them much happier. Now, there are countless ways to start new seeds. I'm going to cover four or five methods here in this episode, and I'm going to start with the method I use personally. I like the old school paper towel technique. It is very simple. I get a plate out of the cupboard, just a glass plate like you'd serve a meal on or make a sandwich. I also get a paper towel, just like you'd use to clean up that meal or that sandwich. I fold the paper towel one time, then I fold it again. Now you've just got a little rectangular paper towel. I set that paper towel onto the glass plate, and then I get a bottle of water. I prefer bottled water for this because I don't want the chlorine or whatever else is in my tap water affecting my new seedlings. So I've got the folded paper towel sitting on the plate. I simply soak that paper towel with water. It will only hold so much. I simply saturate it. Then I tip the plate to the side to make sure all that excess water runs out of the paper towel and off of that plate. Just drain it right off into the sink. That water is gone. So now you've got a soggy paper towel in the middle of a plate. I place my seeds in the paper towel and then I gently fold it one more time. If you want to fold it another time, you can and make a little tiny square. That's fine. But I think that first fold will be just fine. Just fold it up to where those seeds are in the middle and they're getting wet and they're not getting any light. The way that that wet paper towel works, it'll kind of seal itself up so the seeds won't move around too much. There won't be any light in there. So you've got some seeds folded up in a wet paper towel and those are sitting on a plate. Now, at this point, you've got a couple of options. If you are able to pay attention to those seeds and be around them all the time and make sure they don't get dry, you can just leave them on that plate and leave them exposed. If it's not too hot or not too cold in your area, they will sprout just fine, just left sitting like that. If you want to slow down the amount of moisture leaving that paper towel and try to keep it moist a little bit longer without having to pay so much attention, just set another plate over it. Flip the plate upside down and set it on top of the first plate, just like you do if you had a sandwich in there and you didn't want anything to get to the sandwich. So you just got two plates with your little folded up paper towel in there. You have to keep it moist at all times. Do not let it get dry. 
If you feel like you're going to get forgetful, or if you need to go to work for an extended period of time and you cannot monitor the moisture of your new seedlings, you can always set them in a baggie. Put your folded paper towel with the moisture in it in a baggie. This will give the moisture nowhere to go. It will be trapped inside that little environment. Just make sure you check on them as soon as you get home from work. If you leave that wet paper towel folded up in a baggie in a really warm spot for too long, you can create a mildew situation. So make sure you pop that open, get some fresh air in there, and check on that as soon as you get home from work. So it sounds really easy because it is. You are folding a paper towel into a square. You're moistening it. You're letting the excess moisture run off. We set the seeds onto that moist paper towel and then we fold it to cover them up. And then if you need to, place another plate over it to slow down the dry time. If you're really forgetful and you're going to be away for a while, put it in a baggie to retain that moisture. Then set it somewhere semi-warm. Most of the time, if you are comfortable in that area, your seedlings are probably comfortable as well. Room temperature is acceptable for seedlings. A great spot for seedlings, if you do not forget them, is on top of the refrigerator. That temperature that happens right on top of the refrigerator is perfect for seedlings. If you don't forget them, put them in a baggie, set them right on top. They should be ready in 12 to 24, maybe 36 hours. If you've got a, one of those old big TVs, nobody's got those big old TVs anymore. They used to get warm on the back. That was a great spot to set seedlings in a baggie. It was on the back of the old Sony Trinitron 36-inch TV where it got warm from playing video games all day. That would be the perfect temp for seedlings. Other than those subtle heat sources like the top of the fridge or the back of the TV, I really don't recommend a heat mat for germinating new seeds or for your clones. I've seen more clones and seeds destroyed, roasted, and barbecued than I have ever seen assisted by one of those heat mats, but I'm going to talk about that more later in the episode, I think, so let's skip that for now and try to stay focused. All right, so we've got our seedlings. They are folded up in a paper towel. We're keeping them moist. We don't want them soggy. We don't want them dripping all the time. We want to keep them moist and comfortable. So you've got them folded in the paper towel and you are checking on them every few hours if you were able. They're easy to check on. Just set your hand right on that paper towel. Don't crush the seeds. Just set your hand on there gently. And if the paper towel is kind of cold, kind of chilly, they're probably wet enough. If you don't feel like it's wet enough, moisten it up a little bit. Get your water bottle and just pour the water on there gently and then tip the, uh, the plate over to where the excess water runs off into the sink. And then you've got to moisten it up for the rest of the day. They should only be in this paper towel for 12 to 24, maybe 36 or 48 hours before you see them starting to pop open. It will pop open on one side and a little white tail will start coming out. That is exactly what we are looking for. That is the start of life. That is a taproot. That is the beginning of everything. That little root is going to dig down into the pot once we pot it and it's going to dig down and start finding nutrients and that's going to be the legs. That's going to be the foundation. And then it's going to start shooting that seedling straight upward toward the light and then it's going to shoot little leaves out of there and that little seedling will fall off and then you've got a little plant. So that is the start of everything happening right there. And you get to see it because you've just got it right there in that paper towel. It's not buried under anything. So you can check on them. Check on them about 12 hours. If you don't see anything, check on them in 24 hours. If you don't see anything, go 36. You're going to get impatient after 24 hours. You'll be checking on them every four to six hours. Don't worry. Just keep checking. Don't forget about them. We only need maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch of that taproot to pop out before our seedlings are ready to put into soil. But we will get to that. So I think I covered how to germinate seeds in a paper towel. You fold it, you wet it, you drain it, put the seeds in there, fold it again, and then you keep an eye on it and keep it moist. Keep it slightly warm, but don't roast it. If you think you might forget about your seedlings, place the paper towel set up in a baggie and that will keep them moist until you open it. Once again, don't forget about them. Make sure you check on them. Then when you unfold that paper towel and you've got little tap roots sticking out, that's when it's time to get ready to put them into your potting mix. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later. The only thing left to cover in this section is what if those seeds don't pop open after 48 hours? The only thing you can really do is wait a little bit longer, maybe increase the heat. If you didn't already set them on the fridge, maybe set them up there on top of the refrigerator where it's a little warmer, maybe lessen the moisture. Maybe you've got them a little too wet. Maybe just keep that paper towel just damp. Maybe you've still got a little bit of a chance, but if they haven't opened after 48 or 72 hours, I would consider starting a fresh batch of seeds at that point. 
Now, if it is really cold in your environment, it will take longer for your seeds to germinate. So expect that. If you're growing in the basement in Colorado, you've got them sitting right on a concrete floor. That's going to take longer. Consider your environment. Like I said earlier, the warmth will speed things up, but that too can go wrong in excess. So try to stay in the right area. Try to be about 70 to 85 degrees ish, and you should be okay with rapid growth for your seeds. Now let's talk about our next method for sprouting our seeds. Our next method is using rapid rooters or root riots or whatever type of plugs are available in your area. Although I am not including rock wool cubes in this section. I don't like rock wool cubes for sprouting seeds. They do not work well for sprouting seeds. I would not recommend that. If it's what you've got, do it similarly to what I recommend here with the rapid rooters. But before you use your rock wool cubes, make sure you clean them out and make sure you soak them in a pH balanced solution. Rinse them very well to get anything out of them. Then soak them either in clean water or a light nutrient solution that has been pH around six. You don't want to use rock wool cubes without rinsing them and adjusting the pH. So this is all about rapid rooters or root riot plugs. When we start with these plugs, we need to soak them. So I get a container based on the amount of plugs I'm going to use. I'm generally using a five gallon bucket. I think they're sold in a 50 pack. So most of the time I just do all 50 and I either do 50 clones or 50 seedlings. I just use the whole package. You soak as many as you need. What I do is I get a container that will fit enough water to soak as many plugs as I'm going to use. I adjust the pH to somewhere between six and six, three. I usually place the rapid rooter plugs back into the rapid rooter tray. If you're not using the tray, that's okay. You don't need it, but that's usually what I do. I put it right in the tray. Then I take a seed and I insert the seed into the rapid rooter plug. That seed goes pointy end down. If you look at your seeds, it's got a round end and it's got a pointy end. It will be obvious when you look at it. The pointy end goes down. This is important because of the way that the seed grows. Pointy end down when you're putting it into a rapid rooter or any sort of a cube, or if you're going directly into soil, pointy end down. Also, if you are going into a rapid rooter, if you're going into a root riot cube, if you're going into soil, or if you're going against my advice and you're going directly into rock wool, it is always suggested that you plant your seeds about one knuckle deep. Just go just the tip of your finger, just push it in until you press that first knuckle, right? That first bend in your finger. That's far enough. Stop pushing. That seedling is deep enough into the soil. It's deep enough into that cube. It will live there. It doesn't need to be buried way down in there. It stands a much better chance if it's just about knuckle deep is all you need to go. So after I've got all my seedlings planted and I've got all my cubes labeled, make sure you label each cube. If you're planting different strains, make sure you've got a way to label each cube so you know what you've got. Also label, if you're doing more than one paper towel of seeds, make sure you label that paper towel some way. Most of you are just doing one pack of seeds or one strain, but if you're doing multiple, please carefully label things. So we've got our seeds. They are in our rapid rooter cubes. They are carefully labeled. They are nice and moist. They are about knuckle deep down into the, into the cube. Now I place them under a very light light. You don't need very powerful lighting for sprouting seeds. A really weak LED or a T5 kind of high up is plenty of lighting. A compact fluorescent is probably just enough light. You don't need to go extreme for a seedling, just enough to encourage it to grow. Once it gets bigger, we do need light. But right now, we don't need ridiculous lighting for a small seedling. So place it under a light that will give it warmth and that will encourage it to grow. Now in about two or three days, maybe four or five days at the latest, you should see a little sprout pop out of your cube and you have now got a little seedling. Now that seedling can live in that little rapid rooter for several days, but it's going to need a forever home. It's going to need to go into either some soil or a hydro setup fairly soon. While it's in that rapid rooter, we need to keep it warm. We need to keep it somewhere between 70 and 85 degrees, and we need to keep that root cube moist at all times. Once it dries up, that plant has no life source and it will die. So keep it moist and keep it warm and keep it under a light. And then we need to think about getting it into a good potting mix or into a hydro system very soon so that it can thrive. So that is the basics of sprouting a seed in a rapid rooter or a root riot cube, or against my advice, if you choose to use a rock wool cube, you would use a similar method. Basically, soak it with the proper pH solution, then press the seedling in, pointy end down, and only go about a knuckle deep, set it under a light, and leave it alone for two or three days. You should see a little sprout pop up.
If you don't see the sprout pop up, look in the little hole and see what you see. Sometimes the seedling simply gets caught and it's bent over and it can't pop itself up out of the root cube. That happens. You can carefully get a pair of tweezers or a chopstick and very gently encourage that plant to grow straight up. Don't pull it out of the seed casing. Don't pull it out of the cube. Maybe spread the hole of the cube open just a little bit and encourage it to pop out of there. It just needs to bend up and come out. You can probably guide it out if you're gentle. If it's close to doing it on its own, don't touch it. Just let it struggle and it will come out. If you feel like it's been long enough and you're getting impatient, just give it a little tug. It may pop out for you. Keep in mind, you're risking killing this seedling if you get too rough. You're going to destroy it if you get too rough, but you've got a good chance. Just use your thumbs and spread that rapid rooter open just a little tiny bit, and you may open it just enough for that seed to unbind itself and be able to pop straight up. It may just be stuck. It's trying to move up and the two leaves on the top, they just got stuck somewhere. That happens quite a bit and it'll just have to break itself free. So pay attention to that if it doesn't pop up in four or five days. If the others have popped up and you've got one that didn't pop up, look in there. That could be the issue with that one seedling. Now let's kind of touch on another method that is very similar to the rapid rooters and the root riot cubes, but it is also very different. This next method you cannot put this into a hydro kit as simply as you could a rapid rooter or as simply as you could a seed from a paper towel. I'm sure some people have done it. I'm sure some people do it, but it's not as easy. It's much more challenging and it's not as uh, logical. So let's talk about using Jiffy Cubes. Jiffy Cubes are great if you're going to go into soil. But like I said, you can't really use them going into a hydro system. I'm sure there's somebody doing it going to tell me I'm wrong, but it's not common. So a Jiffy Cube. They are very similar to the rapid rooters, but they start off really small and you moisten them and they expand to the proper size. So you moisten them, they puff up, you squeeze the excess water out of them. Then from there, they work just like the rapid rooters or the root riot cubes. You place your seeding in, seedling in there, pointy in down, and you go about knuckle deep, and then you've got to keep your jiffy cube moist just like you do with your other cubes. Now, if you're using rapid rooters or root riots or jiffy cubes, or if you're going against my advice still and using the rock wool cubes, make sure not to get them too moist for too long. If they are too moist, they will simply rot your seedlings. They will turn green. They will turn brown. They will fall over and die, or they will not even germinate at all. There's a big difference between being soaked and being wet and being moist. We want to soak them in the beginning put the seeds in there when they are soaked, then just keep it wet from there. You can usually tell by looking at the rapid rooters how dry or wet they are. When they start getting that brown crusty color, they're too dry. When they start getting that sheen to them, they start showing a little silver, a little light reflection. That's just right. When they're really, really black, that's when they are soaked. So learn how to identify soaked and saturated and wet and moist and create a little scale for yourself. I did the one through five watering technique. Maybe we need a similar thing for the rapid rooters. I kind of just did that. If they're totally soaked in black, that's a five. If they're dry and crispy, that's a one. We need to keep them about a three at all times, ladies and gentlemen. So there we go. One through five tech on rapid rooters, just like we did on watering normal plants. So now we know how to germinate seeds in paper towels. We know how to germinate seeds in rapid rooters. We kind of know how to do it in rock wool cubes. We know how to germinate seeds in jiffy cubes. It is just like doing it in the rapid rooters. You guys, you moisten them, they expand, you squeeze the excess water out of there. Then you treat it just like a rapid rooter from there. Our next option is to plant our seedlings directly into soil. That's the way it happens in nature. Why wouldn't we do that in our personal garden? So let's talk a little bit about planting our seeds directly into soil or the medium we are going to use. If you plan to start your seedling in soil, I highly recommend you use a very small container. I would recommend a beer cup or something that size. There's no reason to have a tiny, tiny plant in a large container of soil. So my first recommendation is a small container with plenty of drainage. My second recommendation will be a good soil for starter plants, something with a lot of aeration and something with not too much nutrients added to it. Maybe something with some mycos or maybe some beneficial bacteria. That's good, but we don't need a lot of boosts for our little babies. So start with a small container of high quality starter soil. So I've got my container and I've got my starter soil. 
Now I moisten that soil before I put my seedlings into there. Just simply water that soil with a pH adjusted solution. You don't need nutrients, just water pH around six to six, three. You should be just fine. Just water it on in, let it drain out. Once it's done draining, take your pointer finger and just make a little tiny hole. Just knuckle deep. Just like I keep saying in the episode, I may name the episode that just go about one knuckle deep into the soil then take your seedling and just set it right inside that hole. Then gently press the dirt right over that seedling. Just real gently. You don't need to pack it down. Just cover up that seedling and then just let it rest. And then within 24 to 48 to 36, maybe 72 hours, you should see a little baby plant just popping up right out of there. You'll just see two little green leaves just popping right up out of that topsoil. I like to keep my little baby plants in the beer cups under a T5 light. I try to keep the light kind of far when they're little. And then as they get bigger, I move the light a little bit closer. I try not to let the seedlings get too stretchy. If they start getting a little leggy, I move the light closer. I like to put a fan on them while they're little. That gives them a little strength, makes them a little more robust. So there are advantages and disadvantages to starting them in the beer cup. The advantage, they're already in their soil. You don't have to up pot them. You don't have to transplant them. You don't have to do any damage to a little seedling. The disadvantage is Sometimes you just completely lose a seedling in a beer cup filled with soil. Sometimes they just totally disappear. Sometimes they don't sprout at all. And sometimes you totally drown them by trying to water so much soil. So starting them in beer cups in soil is a little trickier, but it may be the only option for some people. Not everybody is able to order rapid rooters or root riot cubes. Not everybody has access to a rock wool cube. And some people may just want to try it because that's the way it happens in nature. So that is a rundown of my basic methods of germinating seeds. Hopefully one of those methods works for you. Honestly, I use the folded paper towel method the most. In a commercial environment, I may use the rapid rooter method next, but I honestly do not start seeds directly in soil anymore. I found that I can start a lot more in much less space by using the rapid rooters. Imagine the amount of space it takes to start 100 rapid rooters compared to 100 beer cups. It's a large difference in the amount of space that you need. I honestly don't have any experience with the Jiffy Cubes. I've never had to use those. I've always had access to the Rapid Rooters. And honestly, I've just been sticking with the paper towel method. So that's what I'm doing the most. I encourage you to use the method that works the best for you. I encourage you also to try different methods. If you think something works great, why not try another method? If you've got some seeds that you can spare, why not try something? You may find that something works better for you. All right, so now we've got our seeds germinated. We've either got some seeds folded into a paper towel or we've got a rapid rooter or a root riot or a rock wool cube with roots hanging out of the bottom of the root cube. Our next step is to pot our new seedling into a pot of soil or soilless mix. In this episode, I will cover how to pot the seeds germinated from a paper towel into soil. But my next episode is going to be about cutting clones. Then shortly after that, we will have to pot the clones into soil, which means I'm going to do a combo episode of planting our new seedlings in the rapid rooters and planting clones in rapid rooters into soil at the same time. I'm just going to knock that out in one episode. So that part will be coming soon. But for now, let's talk about planting our freshly germinated seedlings that are just sitting in a wet paper towel. I like to catch these seeds when the new tap roots are very short. I don't like to get it too long and too out of control because I feel like that gives me too much opportunity to cause it too much stress. So as soon as I see my seedlings crack open a little bit and that little tap root is sticking out just a little tiny bit, I'm comfortable putting them into their soil or soilless mix. And I do that with a very similar method as I did earlier when we talked about planting seeds into the beer cups. I get a beer cup or a very small pot with plenty of drainage. I fill it with a quality soil that is good for small plants, something with a lot of aeration and plenty of drainage. Then I moisten that soil with water pH around 6 to 6.3. Then I do the same thing as we've been doing the whole episode. I make a little tiny hole about knuckle deep in that soil. Then I simply place the germinated seed in that little hole. I do my best to point it with that little white root pointing straight down. If your tap root is nice and short, don't worry about which direction your seedling is facing when you place it into soil. It should be just fine. If it's really long, you may want to make sure you point that root down and the seed is going up. 
So gently place your seedling in the soil, brush dirt over the top of it. You don't need to bury it or pack it down. Just cover it. And then the taproot will go down. It'll start to spread out and the little tiny plant will grow up to the top and it'll push the seedling with a little set of tiny, tiny leaves right through the topsoil and you'll have a little starter baby plant. The main thing to worry about when potting your new seedlings is to not damage that little white taproot sticking out of the seedling. Do your best not to disrupt, stress, or damage that little white taproot. They're very delicate. So once I've got it potted, I put it under a T5 light. I keep the light a little distance away so that I don't shock the plant. As the plant gets bigger, I bring the light a little bit closer. Once I feel like the plant is kind of taken off, I put a fan on it. And then once it gets its first set of serrated leaves, I start adding very light doses of nutrients. So that is how I pot my seedling that was germinated from a paper towel. I basically fill a beer cup with good dirt, poke a hole in the bottom, go knuckle deep in the soil on the top, drop my little germinated seedling in there and cover it up and then put it under the light and wait for it to pop up. And then it grows and grows until I see a set of leaves with serration. And that is when I start feeding it a little bit of light nutrients. Now let's talk about a couple of things that happen quite often when we are working with seeds. Sometimes the seed shell will get stuck to the seed and hinder the seed's growth and threaten that seed's life. That is not as scary as it looks. When it happens, you'll know what I'm talking about. That seed hole will just get stuck. The, the seedling will come up out of the dirt and you'll see that seed. The leaves are trying to open up. It's trying to live and it's just trying to open up, but it can't because that seed casing is just stuck to it. That is really easy to solve. I get a spray bottle with water and I moisten that seedling really heavily. Just spray it with water. Just keep spraying it. More moisture, more moisture, more moisture. Then see if you can just brush it off with your finger. It may just come right off. If not, spray more water. If that still doesn't work, get some tweezers and just do a gentle dissection. If it is really moist, you should be able to get that seed casing off. It is supposed to come off of there. That plant opens up. The way the plant opens itself up, the way that that seed casing spreads in half, it should pop right off of there. Just give it a little assistance, a little moisture, little tweezers, maybe a pair of chopsticks, depending on how skilled you are. It shouldn't be too hard to do. Don't be afraid to get in there and pull that casing off. Earlier, I talked about not using heat mats. I've honestly seen people roast more seeds with heat mats than I've ever seen success with a heat mat from a seedling. The only time I have ever needed a heat mat was when I was growing in a warehouse in Colorado and it was really cold during the winter. Other times I don't use a heat mat for cloning or for seedlings and I have great success. If you are comfortable in the area, your seedlings are probably comfortable in that area also. And I'm not talking about some Colorado mountain boy who's outside barefoot in the snow. I'm talking about a normal person. Room temperature is acceptable for your seedlings. Now, I've got one more thing I want to touch on before I start wrapping up the episode, and the note I wrote is called pre-soak. A lot of people like to pre-soak their seeds before the official germination. If you have got older seeds that have been sitting around for longer, I may, may recommend you give them a pre-soak. It's really easy. You simply pre-soak them in water before you germinate them. I recommend 12 hours, maybe 24 at the most. Never go more than 24 hours on a soak because that will drown your seeds. My theory behind the pre-soak is some seeds just have a hard outer coating and they don't want to germinate very easily. Soaking them in water for 24 hours will definitely soften that outer coating and encourage easier germination. So if you've got older seeds that you've been having a problem getting to germinate, maybe soak them for 12 hours, then give them the paper towel method. If that doesn't work, try soaking some for 24 hours, then giving them the paper towel method. If that doesn't work, then we're going to need to try more scientific approaches. There are chemicals we can add. There are tricks we can do, but that is much more advanced science than what we're prepared for today. So if you've got old seeds or if you feel like you've got really hard seeds with a really thick coating, don't be afraid to give them a pre-soak. 12 to 24 hours, never go more than 24 hours. I don't feel like that's a good idea. All right, you guys, I feel like that is a good lesson on how to germinate your seeds. I will not forget to teach you guys how to pot those freshly sprouted seeds that you've got in your rapid rooters or your rock wool cubes like I told you not to do or in your jiffy pots. We'll talk about that in a future episode. That is written down. That is on the schedule. You guys, I want to thank you for listening to another episode. 
I want to encourage you guys to support the Patreon campaign. If you feel like this podcast was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to make a financial contribution to the show, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need to sign up will be right there. And I do appreciate all the support. Big thank you to everybody who has been helping me out. I would also appreciate it if you find me on all of the social media. You can stalk me on Facebook. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. On Twitter, it's at GFYH podcast. If you'd like to follow my personal Twitter account, it is Rasta Jeff 420. Also, I encourage you to follow my Instagram. It's Irie underscore genetics, I R I E underscore G E N E T I C S, Irie underscore genetics on Instagram. Give me a follow, check out my fine cannabis photography, and also check out my Instagram live videos where my friends come and ask me cannabis questions. I answer cannabis questions. I take some dabs. We hang out. Sometimes we get goofy. It is always a good time. I encourage you to participate there. I recently just hit 19,000 followers on Instagram. So big shout out to everybody for supporting my Instagram efforts. You guys, don't forget that the podcast is available on iTunes and Stitcher, and every episode is available on the YouTube channel. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. You guys, I'm going to wrap up this podcast. I think you could tell my throat is burning out. I'll be back in just a few days with fresh new content. Thank you guys for listening. I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Indica Doggo. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's time for episode 364 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode of the show is brought to you by our friends at the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at dankseed.store. I like to start the show off by letting you know what I'm smoking. I just took a gigantic dab of Stardog Ambrosia from Apothecary Farms. I always love the flavor of the Stardog. I love the effect of the Stardog, and the folks at Apothecary always get it right. So big shout out to Apothecary Farms and the Stardog Ambrosia Extracts. All right, you guys, this is going to be another grow lesson. If you've been following along, I've been doing a long series of grow lessons. In this lesson, we're going to talk about cutting clones. We're going to cut clones into rapid rooters. We will cut clones for use in an easy cloning machine. And we will also talk briefly about cutting clones directly into cups of soil. I feel like I have a lot of detailed information written down. So let's not waste a lot of time with the long intro. Let's get right into a grow lesson. Let's talk about cutting clones. I think a good spot to start talking about cutting clones is beginning with healthy mother plants. You need a healthy donor plant to have a healthy clone. I suggest you listen to episode 315 and learn all about healthy mother plants. So if you've listened to episode 315 or if you feel like you are up to speed and you have healthy veg plants or healthy mother plants, let's get into a lesson on cutting clones. Let's talk briefly about why we take clones. Why do I want to cut a clone from a healthy plant? That is a really good question. First off, I suggest you cut a clone from every new plant you grow. Have a clone. If you've got the opportunity to cut a clone and keep a clone in another veg space, I always recommend that. You may get a pack of seeds. You may grow that pack of seeds and find the most amazing plant in that pack of seeds. And if you did not take a clone, guess what? It's gone. You can't grow that again. The advantage to cutting clones is if you do find a keeper in a pack of seeds, you can grow that same keeper over and over again if you have taken a clone. You have reliable tested genetics. You know it's a female, you know it's potent, you know it tastes good, and you know it grows the way you want it to grow. So that's the main point of taking a clone from any type of plant. You are getting a reproduction of the plant you are familiar with. So we take a clone, then you can either grow out that clone or you can create a mother plant from that clone and take multiple clones from that plant and fill your grow room or rooms with that same cultivar over and over again and have repeatable, reliable results with that clone. Seeds do show variation. We try to narrow down the variation in seeds through breeding, but that does take time. If you're growing from clones, you know you are going to have exact copies. If you take 100 clones off of one plant and you put those all in a grow room, they're all going to act exactly the same. You shouldn't see any variation in there. So that is the point and the purpose and the advantage of growing with clones and why we want to learn how to take clones. Now, I know somebody out there listening is going to bring up the subject of genetic drift. I suggest you take a listen to episode 343 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast, and you will hear my full opinion of genetic drift. In this episode, I'm going to cover three common methods for cutting clones. In all three of those methods, 
one of the most important things we can think about is cleanliness of the plants and cleanliness of our tools and cleanliness of our environment. Cleanliness is very important when cutting clones. Think of it this way. We're taking a plant. We're taking something sharp. We are cutting that plant. We are severing a limb from our plant. Hopefully the tool we used was clean and sanitized. Hopefully that plant was pest and pathogen free. Hopefully you were wearing gloves. So we've just made a fresh cut in a plant. We've got a plant with a cut in it. We've got a fresh cut with an open wound at the bottom of it. We have a lot of opportunity for infection or pathogen to enter this plant at this point. Keep your environment clean. Now, everywhere you set that clone needs to be clean. The product you dip that clone into needs to be clean and contaminant free. So when you're pouring out your dipping gel, your clone X gel, or whatever you choose to use, don't dip your clones directly into the container. Pour out about a shot glass worth at a time and dip your fresh cuts into there before you stick them. That is my recommendation to keep some sanitation going through the grow. So every step of cloning, we need to think about cleanliness. Cleanliness is very important. Clean out your cloning trays before you use them. Clean your cloner before you use it. Clean your clone plugs. Even if you just bought them, rinse them off. Those neoprene collars, give them a nice rinse. If you're using permaclone collars, clean them. They're reusable. All you've got to do is sanitize them. It is very easy. They came with instructions on how to clean them. Follow those instructions and you can use those over and over again with no problems. Clean every part of the cloning process. Think about it this way. We are basically performing major surgery on our cannabis plants. Would you want to be in that environment with your arm severed? Would you trust me in your clone room to say, I got it, bro, and grab whatever scissors you use to cut the clone. I'm going to cut your arm with off with that, okay? Then I'm going to set your arm wherever you put the clones after you chop them. You cut a bunch of clones and then you set them down somewhere until you get a chance to dip them and stick them because they can't all go at once. Wherever you set those clones, I want to set your severed arm. How do you feel about that? Are you okay with that? Is it that clean? Then I want to dip your severed arm into some clone gel. We're not going to clone your arm. We're going to stop there. But I want your mind to think about that level of cleanliness. Also, are you comfortable running around with that severed arm in that grow environment? Is it clean enough? Or are you looking around going, I'm going to get some dirty shit in this stump? Think about that in your cloning environment. Clean it up. It doesn't take that long. Get a broom. Get a mop. Clean some shit up. The process of cutting clones will give your plants a lot of opportunity to pick up problems. This is where we see people pick up problems that they later try to identify as genetic drift. So wear gloves, clean your tools, clean all of your equipment, use fresh neoprenes. If you're not using permaclone clone collars, you need to replace them every time. Don't try to reuse those cheapos. They have a lot of space in there where things can build up. The permaclone collars are made out of a different product. You can clean them. Don't try to reuse the cheapos, please. You will get problems. Clean everything. That is my point. Let's move forward from talking about cleanliness. Let's talk about the actual procedure for cutting clones. The two methods I use most commonly in a commercial grow environment or in my own personal grows are cutting into rapid rooters or using easy cloners or the Botanicare turbo cloner machines. When I talk about the easy cloner or the turbo cloner, I will probably say easy cloner all the time. I mean the same thing. They're both very similar machines. So let's talk about cutting clones first into rapid rooters. This is a very common method. It's very cost effective and it does not require an expensive machine. So let's get right into it. Cutting clones in rapid rooters. Step one, soak the rapid rooter plugs in a weak but pH balanced nutrient solution. If you're using bottled nutrients, you can use your veg nutrients at about a quarter strength for your clones. So fill up a gallon container of water, pour in a quarter strength worth of nutrients, and then adjust the pH between 5.8 and 6.0. Now, I usually get the tray with the whole setup that's got the little spots for those plugs to go. So I've got a little spot to keep them stood up. If you don't want to buy the whole tray, you don't have to do that many clones, but it's a lot easier. I find filling the whole tray keeps the moisture level easier to control inside of the dome. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So you soak your plugs. Then you put all of those plugs in the tray. I put all 50 of them in the tray. Then once all 50 of them are in there, now it is time to go and cut our clones. I like to cut clones from a few different parts of the plant. When I'm topping my plants, I quite often make clones from that super healthy fat top of the plant. Those make beautiful clones. If I've already cut the top out, I also make clones from when I lollipop. When you go clean off the bottoms of the plants, I usually clean up the bottom six or eight, maybe 10 or 12 inches, depending on the size of the plant, those bottom branches, those make beautiful clones. 
You can take your clone from any part of the plant as long as it is healthy and as long as you are happy with removing that section of the plant. Right before I flip my plants into flower, I do a major cleanup anyway, so that's a good opportunity for me to get clones off the bottom parts of those plants. So try to cut your clones from the healthiest part of the plant. Take about a 5 to 8 inch cut off of your mother plant, and when you cut it, try to cut at a 45 degree angle. We're going to talk a little bit about that 45 degree angle here in just a couple of minutes. Now, always, always clean your scissors, you guys. Clean your scissors with rubbing alcohol and when you change mother plants, if you cut 20 clones off of this mother plant and then you decide to cut clones off of another mother plant, clean your scissors between plants. Earlier, we talked about this being just like surgery. You wouldn't use the same scissors on different patients. You don't want to spread disease. That's the exact same reason why we want to clean our scissors between mother plants. Now, when I'm cutting clones, I try to take a small cup with a little bit of water with nutrient solution in it, and I take as many cuttings as I need at one time and fill that cup and then take that cut back to my cloning station. I don't go cut a clone, then take that back to the station, and then go cut another one, and then take it back. I'll go get as many as I need. If I need 50, I'll go find 50 good clones of one strain. Then I head back to the clone station. I clean them up. I dip them, and I stick them. Then I can put the dome on, and then I can leave them alone for a few days. I don't have to keep walking back and forth between each cut. I don't have to worry about the plants wilting because the dome isn't on. I don't have to keep taking the dome off and on trying to rescue plants. It's much more efficient and gentler on the plants to go take all of our cuts and then head back to the clone station and work on all of them at once. So I've taken all of my cuttings and I'm back at the clone station. Now I'm going to take each cutting. It's about five to eight inches long, depending on the genetics and the stretchiness of that plant. On a five to eight inch cutting, you may have one or two little side nodes sticking off of it. But at the top, we have got that fresh new growth coming right out of the top. And then there are those two main leaves coming right out of the top of that branch. We basically want to remove everything from our clone other than those two top leaves and that new part sticking out of the top. We don't need much more than that. Less is more when it comes to taking clones in a rapid rooter. We don't need a lot of material to get started. Once you get more experienced at it, once you get better, you may be able to take larger clones, but smaller clones are easier in this type of setup. So all we really need is those top two leaves and that new fresh part coming right out of the top. There's nothing really there to sustain life in this clone, so we don't need to give it a lot of stuff to try to keep alive. We don't need to burden this plant by having a whole bunch of extra leaves and extra little side branches. So just those top two plus the new stuff coming out is all we need. Clean that all up. I generally cut those two top leaves. I trim them quite a bit. So think about it this way. The leaf is oval shaped. It starts off real skinny. It gets wider, it gets wider, and then at some point, it starts to taper back in. Right where it tapers in is where I cut that leaf tip off. So right at the widest part of that leaf, I just cut it right off. So now I've got a little stalk with these two leaves that have been trimmed up, and then just this little fresh part coming right out of the top of it. There's not a lot there, but that is much easier for us to sustain than a big plant in a clone dome. So now I've got this little stick with these trimmed up little leaves with this fresh growth coming out of the top. Now at the very bottom of that, when we cut it off, we should have cut at a 45 degree angle. If you didn't make a nice 45 degree angle when you originally cut it, go ahead and make the bottom of that stem a nice 45 degree angle. Now, the next thing I do is use a razor blade to gently scrape the edge of my clone. Anything that's going to be submerged into the rapid rooter, I gently, very gently give it a scrape. I just want to take off that very top layer, just disrupt the very outside layer of that clone so that it will kind of break that skin and give it an opportunity to root a little more. So I give it a very, very light scraping. All of the clone that is going to be dipped into the rapid rooter will get just a very light scraping. Don't overdo it. If you see the white part of the plant, you've gone too deep. You just want to kind of disrupt the outer layer of the plant. So I just take a razor blade. Sometimes I even use my cloning scissors and I just rough up that edge just a little bit. You'll see the outer layer is a little bit of a different color than the inside layer. That's how you'll know you're doing it properly. Again, don't go too far. You can kill your clones by cutting too deep this way. Just give them a very little scrape. If you want to skip this step until you learn what you're doing, that is okay. But this may speed you up just a little bit by breaking that outer layer of the fleshy plant material. So we've got a nice cleaned up plant. We've cut a nice 45 degree angle. We've kind of scraped it up a little bit to remove that outer skin to give it an opportunity to root. Now we need to dip our fresh cutting into a rooting hormone. I've been doing my best to not recommend any specific brands or products, but what I have had the best experience with has been the Purple Clonex Cloning Gel. 
That works great for cutting clones into rapid rooters. It works great for cutting clones into rock wool cubes. It works perfectly for cutting clones into the easy clone machines. And it also works well for cutting clones directly into soil. I'll tell you right away that that product is not organic and many people will have opinions about that product. I am aware of what I'm using. I've done the reading, I've done the research, and I know what is in there and I am okay with it. You may want to do a little bit of research when you are selecting your cloning hormones. And since I'm on the subject, always wear gloves when using any type of cloning solution. All right, so we've got our Clonex gel or whatever cloning solution you have chosen. I usually pour mine out of the container. I don't like to dip my clone directly into that container. If there is a problem with my donor plant, now I have just dipped that dirty plant right into my cloning solution. And I plan on using this cloning solution to make all of my clones, which means I'm going to set myself up for failure from the very beginning. So pour your cloning solution out of the bottle into a smaller container. I usually use a shot glass or something similar. Whatever you choose to use, don't pour the leftovers back into the container. That defeats the whole purpose. So pour out some cloning solution, then simply dunk the fresh cut end of your new cutting into that cloning gel. Just stir it around so that it gathers a little bit. Then gently place that end right into that hole in the rapid rooter. Don't press too hard. If it bends or kinks over, you've broken it and you've killed that clone. You've either got to cut that end off and start fresh or start with the fresh cutting. So gently push that cutting into that plug. Now you don't want it to penetrate all the way through the bottom. If it pokes out all the way through the bottom, that end of it is just going to rot and it's going to turn black and die. If you've buried your cutting too far under the rooter, it'll be okay. Just grab it and pull it right on out. Just pull it real gently and back it out just a little bit and it will be fine. So make sure you go deep enough into the root plug for the plant to grab and have some sort of life in there, but don't go so far that it pokes all the way through. When we were planting seeds, I taught you to only go knuckle deep. You may need to go a little deeper than that when you're sticking your cuttings into the rapid rooters. If you're using a rapid rooter or a root riot, I recommend you go about three quarters of the way into the root plug. So if they're an inch deep, go three quarters of an inch down into that plug. And now you basically repeat that process until you've got your desired amount of clones cut, dipped, and stuck into the cubes. Once I've got my tray full, I spray the inside of the dome, I close the vents of the dome, I put that on the tray, and then I set it underneath a T5 light. I like to put my T5 light about 6 to 10 inches above my clone dome, and I leave those lights on for 24 hours a day. You'll find it is much easier to control the environment around your clones if they don't have any changes in light cycle. Every time the light goes on and the light goes off, the temperature and the humidity will change and you will change the environment in your clone dome. Your goal is to keep your clones warm and moist and humid. So by keeping the light on all of the time, we're able to keep a consistent environment inside of that dome. So now we have got our fresh cuttings cleaned up. We've got them dipped into cloning solution. We've got them stuck into the rapid rooters. We sprayed the inside of the dome. We closed the vents on the dome. We put the dome on the tray. Then we slid the whole clone set up underneath the T5 light. Now here comes the hardest part. The hard part is waiting. You don't even need to check on your clones for three days if you've got the proper conditions. As long as you see condensation on the inside of that dome over the next few days, you don't need to do anything to those clones. Around day four or five, those clones may need to be remoistened. Pop the dome off of the clones and take a look at the rapid rooters. Don't be afraid to pick one up. Pull it right out of the tray and feel it. Is it heavy? Is it moist? Is it dry? Visually look at it. It's really easy to tell when rapid rooters need moisture by looking at them. When they are soaked, they are black. They look completely black. When they start drying up a little bit, they get a little bit of a silvery gray. When they are too dry, they become brown. Try to keep them moist, but not soggy. If you give it a little gentle squeeze, you don't want the water to run down your arms, but you need a little moisture to stay on your fingers. We want them moist, but not soggy. We need that rapid rooter to be able to hold enough water to sustain life, but we also don't want to have so much water in that rapid rooter that there is no room for oxygen. So check your rapid rooter for moisture. If it is dry, we need to re-moisten it. I recommend using a spray bottle and spraying a very light nutrient mix into the rapid rooters and just spray it until they are soaked. Then pour off the excess water. If there's any water left in that tray, simply pour it off. We don't need water sitting in the bottom of that tray. When roots do start to develop, if they're hanging in that water, they will just rot. It will defeat the purpose. So give the rapid rooters a little bit of a spray. Get them nice and moist. 
Once you've got all the plugs nice and moist, put the dome right back on the tray and put it back under the light. Now on day five, we're going to open the vents on the dome. If you've got a dome with the two small vents, you can open them all the way. If you've got that dome with the giant vent in the middle, I would say maybe go a quarter, maybe go halfway. Don't go all the way right away. That is too much airflow. I feel like that hole is too big. So on day five, we open the vents and start giving those clones a little bit of airflow. Now we're going to need to pay attention to the moisture level a little more frequently because we are allowing moisture out of that dome by opening those vents. We are letting fresh air in, but we are also letting our moisture out. So start paying attention to the clones more frequently. Now, beginning at day six, we are going to start hardening off the clones. What that means is we are simply going to start removing that dome and introducing them to the environment slowly every day. We don't want to just take off that dome and expect the plants to live. That's not going to work. We've got to introduce them to the environment slowly. Right now, they are really relying on that dome to keep the wind down and keep the humidity and moisture in that environment for them. We need to get them used to being in population with the rest of the big plants. The way to do this is to take that dome off and slowly increase the interval without the dome every day. So starting at day six, we're going to take the dome off for 15 minutes. Just take that dome off, let the plant survive for 15 minutes, check on them. If you feel like they're too dry, moisten them up, put the dome right back on, let the plants hang out for the rest of the day. The second day, we're going to crack that dome for 15 minutes. Pop off the dome, see how wet those rapid rooters are. If you feel like they're too dry, moisten them up. Let them sit for 15 minutes. Check the moisture level again before you close them up. If you feel like they're too dry, moisten them up. It's always better to moisten them as you open them so that you don't soak them and then put the lid on. I recommend you take the dome off, moisten them, let them get their 15 minutes of hardening time, then check those rapid rooters again. If you feel like they may need moisture, go ahead and add some, then put that dome on there. We are going to repeat this process again on day three. They get 15 minutes on day three. Then on day four, we are going to increase our interval to 20 minutes. Then on day five, we are going to increase to 30 minutes. Now you have to pay attention to the clones as you're doing this. If they start looking weak or if they're getting angry while the dome is off, feel free to put that dome back on there and rescue your plants. But the goal here is to harden these plants off so they can learn to survive without that dome for protection. So as these clones start getting stronger, we want to leave the dome off longer and longer as time goes on. We should see little roots pop out of these clones around 7 to 10 days. That is very strain dependent, but our goal is to have these little babies into soil around 10 or 14 days into this process. So we need to slowly start getting them used to the outside environment by hardening them off. So increase your open time every day, but also pay attention to the plants and don't stress them. So maybe on day six, you go 35 minutes. Maybe on day seven, you go 40 minutes. Maybe on day eight, you're going all the way up to 45 minutes. Maybe by day 10, you've got them open for a full hour. Our goal here is that when we do transplant these into their six inch net pots or their starter pots, that they don't have to rely on that dome, that they are okay being open all of the time because they will no longer have a dome for protection. So slowly increase your open time. If you can get your clone domes open for two solid hours without seeing any negative effects on your clones, they are certainly ready to go into their soil or cocoa pots. Now, the most common mistake I see when people are making clones is they over moisten the clone plugs. They soak them. They try to drown them. Pay close attention to the amount of moisture in your clone plugs. You don't want to drown them. If you're new at cutting clones, I suggest you take way too many clones. Take way more than what you're going to need because you're going to kill a bunch of them in the learning process. And that is acceptable. This is a learning process. So now we basically have to sustain these clones in this dome until they are rooted enough to put into our soil or soilless mix or go into our hydro setup, whatever we choose to do with them. And I told you that I'm going to talk about potting our seedlings and potting our clones in a future episode. So let's move on to another cloning method. Let's talk about cutting clones directly into soil. If I were going to cut clones directly into soil, I would do it very similarly as the method I used to cut clones into rock wool cubes. The main difference is that I would use a beer cup filled with good soil. I try not to recommend brands, but I'm going to say I would probably use Light Warrior soil for my babies. I would buy a bag of Light Warrior soil and I would buy some beer cups and I would poke a bunch of holes in the bottom of the beer cups for drainage. I would pack up the beer cup with soil. I would moisten the soil. Then I would cut the clone exactly the same as I do for the rapid rooter. I would dip it into the rooting solution. Then I would make a hole in that soil with my finger. In this situation, I would go about two knuckles deep. 
Then you place that dunked clone into that hole and gently backfill that hole. Just push the soil right around the stem. And now you want that plant to be supported. And it looks like you've got a little baby plant sticking out of a beer cup filled with soil. It looks like you're basically done. The next step is to take a clear beer cup and place it upside down on top of that beer cup to act as a dome. Then I use a piece of tape, generally a piece of duct tape, and just wrap it right around there to make sure that that lid stays on there. And you have created a one plant dome situation. You've got a beer cup filled with soil. It's moistened. You've got a plant in there and you've put a dome right on top of it to keep that moisture in. Put that underneath a light and it will act just like the domed clone acts. Just like the rapid rooter, we're going to need to check on that soil. We need to keep it moist. We don't want it soggy. We don't want it soaked and we don't want it dry, but we need it moist and warm so that our clone stays healthy and happy. Now, the advantage here is once that clone roots, we don't have any work to do. It's already transplanted into its first pot. The disadvantage is that it takes as much space as a beer cup for each clone. So you can't fit 50 clones in a small space like you could in a rapid rooter tray. So the beer cups work if you're only trying to take a couple clones and you don't want to go buy rapid rooters and you don't want to buy a dome setup. You can fill up a couple beer cups with dirt, moisten up the soil, put a little hole in there with your finger clip, dip, and stick a few clones, and you can create clones just like you would in a dome setup. Make sure you harden off your cupped clones just like you do your domed clones, and you should have healthy, happy little babies in beer cups. All right, you guys, I've been talking for 25 minutes and my throat is starting to make a funky noise. I'm going to press pause. I'm going to take a drink. I'm going to pull a couple of fat dabs. And when I get back, we will continue a lesson on cloning, and we will talk about cutting clones in an easy cloner or a Botanicare turbo cloner machine. Take a couple of fat dabs, you guys. I will be right back. All right, podcast world, I am back, and it is time to talk about cutting clones in an aero cloner, and that will include an easy cloner or a Botanicare turbo cloner or whatever type of auto cloner you may have purchased or maybe even built on your own. Let's jump right into it. My first piece of advice is to replace all of your clone collars each cycle and start with fresh, clean, neoprene clone collars. The only brand that I am aware of that I would approve of reusing are the Permaclone clone collars. They are made from a different material. They are much easier to sanitize, and they are the only brand that I would recommend recycling. They're the only brand I've had any positive experience trying to reuse. If you're using the cheap neoprenes, it's probably safest and most cost-effective to throw them away and buy freshies every run. It is most cost-effective to buy the Permaclone clone collars and follow their instructions on sanitizing them after each use. And they do not pay me. I've just had a lot of great experience with the product. So always start with fresh, clean clone collars. The next step is to make sure that the cloner is completely cleaned. I like to fill the cloner up with hot water and bleach and let it run for about 24 hours. Then I dump it out, hose it out real well, fill it up with clean water and let it run for just a little while to make sure I rinse all that bleach water out. Then I dump it out and let it dry. Once it's fully dry, I give it a smell. If I don't smell any bleach, I'm pretty sure that it's clean. At this point, I fill it up with clean water. I would suggest RO water if you've got it, but that is not an option for everybody. When I'm filling up the Easy Cloners, I generally fill them right below the halo. The spray halo is where you in, where you screw the emitters. That part's called the halo. There's the pump and then the halo and then the emitters. I fill it up right to the base of the halo. Once I've got the appropriate amount of water in the cloner, I apply Clonex solution, the purple stuff that comes in the tall bottle, not the thick stuff, but the cloning solution, not the clone gel. It's called Clonex solution. I apply that to the cloner to get the EC between 1.0 and 1.2. I want my EC, the electrical conductivity, to be between 1 and 1.2. Then I adjust the pH to 5.7 to 6.2. Now, the next step is to add Clear Res. Clear Res is a product that will prevent algae from building up inside of our cloner. I recommend you put 30 milliliters of Clear Res for every five gallons of water in your cloner. So if you filled it up with a five-gallon bucket, you need 30 milliliters. If you filled it up with 10 gallons, you need 60 milliliters and so forth. Date it. Get a little sticker and write the date on that sticker and put that sticker on the cloner somewhere. That sticker with the date is important because you will need to add clear res again every five days. That's why I put a sticker on there. That way, if you're working in a facility with more than one person, you don't have people doubling up and adding too much clear res. Everybody's on the same page. There's a sticker. 
It says employee number 420, change the clear res on day one. Now, when day five comes around, we know somebody needs to change the clear res. You get 30 milliliters of clear res per five gallons and pour it right on into the cloner. Get a sticker, write employee number 420, put this much clear res in here on this date. And that way we know when to add more and we don't double up. So write down how much clear res you put in there and how often you do it so that you don't double up. And again, I suggest you put 30 milliliters per every five gallons every five days. So now we've added our Clonex solution. We've got our EC somewhere between 1 and 1.2. We've adjusted the pH to somewhere between 5.7 and 6.2. We've added the appropriate amount of clear res. Now let's put the lid on the cloner. Let's turn on the pumps and make sure all of the emitters are properly functioning. You're going to need to open it up and peek in there and make sure that all those sprayers are spraying everywhere and that all of the inside of that cloner is getting coverage. Pop out a couple random neoprenes and put your finger in there and make sure that your finger is getting sprayed. We want to make sure that all of the sprayers are covering all of the cloner spots inside of that cloner. Now, once you're sure that cloner is set up and functioning properly and that all of the emitters are spraying and covering the entire inside of that cloner, it is time to take our cuttings to fill the clone machine. We are going to take our cuttings in a very similar method as we did in the rapid rooter technique. We're going to cut about a five to eight inch cutting. We're going to clean it up. We don't need to trim these leaves as extremely as we did on the other setup, but it is a good idea to cut the tips off a little bit to encourage some growth. So clean up your cutting, then cut it at a 45 degree angle. Stick it in the Clonex gel. I would go about one inch into the Clonex gel. Then those neoprene discs open up like a Pac-Man. Open it up to look like Pac-Man and then close it around your clone. And you want approximately one inch of material sticking out of the bottom of the clone. Then you take that neoprene disc and stick it right back into the machine with that freshly cut part sticking down into the water and the new plant sticking straight up. Now carefully repeat that process until you fill the cloner or you run out of healthy cuttings. Now I like to hang a T5 light above the clone machine and I generally place it about 8 to 12 inches above the canopy of the plants. I also like to leave the light on for 24 hours for these clones. Some people may choose to go 18 on, 6 off. That is up to you. I have had amazing results running the lights on for 24 hours and also leaving the pump inside of the cloner on for 24 hours a day. You can experiment with light cycles and pump cycles as much as you'd like. You may find that 24 hours of light works best for you. You may find that some dark cycle works best for you. If the water in your cloner is getting too hot, a good way to cool that water down is by letting the pump rest for a few seconds every minute or a few minutes every hour. In one situation, I would run the pump for 45 seconds on and 15 seconds off every minute. Those timers are quite expensive. In another environment, I was running the pump on for 45 minutes and off for 15 minutes every hour. And both of those methods worked well for me, but the 24 hour a day method worked just as well. Now we've got our cloner filled up with fresh cuts. It's going to run overnight. Tomorrow we need to check on it. Overnight, that purple cloning solution, which we dunked the cuttings in, is going to be washed off of the plant and it's going to end up in our reservoir, in our water, in our cloner. That's going to make the pH go crazy. So we need to check the pH first thing in the morning and correct it. Don't be surprised if the pH has jumped dramatically. It's because all of that purple stuff dripped off of the plants and it is now in your water. So just simply adjust the pH up or down. Use a few drops of a reliable pH up or down product. Don't use some home remedy or some cheapo product for your cloner. In the cloner, we need a reliable pH up or pH down product. Also, I recommend a reliable pH pen. Don't buy a cheap pH pen. You get what you pay for when it comes to pH testing products. These cuttings are going to live in this cloner for approximately 14 days. We're going to have to check on them every day. There are a few things we need to check on. The first thing we should check on is general plant health. Are they alive? Are they standing up? Are they getting yellow and crinkly? Can you see any spider mites? Can you see any spider mite damage? Can you see any spider mite webbing? Do you see any powdery mildew? Do the plants show any sign of stress? Just give a nice visual inspection of the plants every single day. The next thing I suggest you check is the pump. Is the pump plugged in? Is the pump working properly? The pump is basically the heart of that machine, so make sure it is working. The next thing I recommend you check is the water level. Is the water level 
just below the halo. While you're in there, why not check the temperature? Why not check the pH? And why not check the EC of the water in your cloner? You've got it open. Grab your pens, grab your meters, give it a little test, and write it down. So once you've made sure the pump is working, you've checked the water level, you've checked the EC, you've checked the pH, and you've checked the temperature, I would put the lid back on, and then I would remove one of the collars and put my finger in there and make sure that the water is spraying everywhere. Look inside the hole while that neoprene is gone and see if you can see that all the plants are getting sprayed. Put that neoprene disc back, and if you're brave, lift up the edge of the cloner and look inside and make sure that sprayer is hitting everything. Try to give a visual inspection to each emitter inside of that machine. If you're using an easy cloner, you've probably got the red emitters in there. Make sure none of those are clogged up. If you're using the Botanicare Turbo Cloner, I think that comes with yellow emitters. Make sure none of those are clogged up. If you do find that you've got a clogged emitter, you've got to find something real tiny to poke down in the hole and try to unclog it. Sometimes you have to take the emitter all the way out of the halo to poke it and unclog it. Be very careful. Those things get very brittle and they break very easily. If you plan on unscrewing one, I recommend you have a backup on hand because there's a good chance it's going to break. In fact, while you're thinking about it right now, just go to Amazon and order a bag of replacements because those emitters get broken all the time. And it's going to be really frustrating when you're setting up your machine and you break two of them and you can't run your cloner because you've got two busted emitters. They're very cheap. The frustrating part is you've got to wait for them to get shipped to you. So buy some now and then you've got them for when you do break them because I promise you, you're going to break a lot of them. So that's our everyday inspection. Now, remember we talked about the clear res earlier? We've got what I like to call the fifth day check. Every five days, we need to add more clear res to our cloner. We need to put 30 milliliters of clear res for every five gallons of water in that reservoir. Now, earlier I suggested we check the EC and the pH of our res every day, but it is not required. What is required is that we check it every fifth day. At least make sure you check the pH and the EC every five days. Don't let it go longer than that without checking. Since you're in there adding clear res anyway, unplug the pump, lift up the lid, put your pH meter and your EC meter in there, and just check it and see what it says. Then add your clear res in there, put the lid back on, plug it in, and it's business as usual. If the EC has gotten too low, add a little bit of the Clonex solution. If the pH is out of whack, adjust it appropriately. Always adjust the pH after you add the Clonex solution. If you ever find that the water level has gotten too low, we need to add water. And when we add water, we need to add, of course, Clonex solution. We need to adjust the EC somewhere between 1.0 and 1.2 when we add Clonex solution. If we add water and Clonex solution, of course, we need to adjust the pH again. Always keep the pH between 5.8 and 6.0. Now, here's a random tip. I keep calling the top of the cloner the lid or the top. I keep changing up the name for it, but the top of the cloner has your cuttings in it. So when we're taking off that top to work on the water, be very careful. Keep in mind that the bottoms of your clones are sticking out of the bottom of that cloner. They are in there exposed. If you are going to slide that cloner across the top of the clone machine diagonally to make it rest across the cloner. Don't let it fall to where the bottoms of those cuttings hit the edge of the cloner and get broken. It may be safest to lift the top off and just set it down on the table. It's going to drip water. It's going to drip stuff onto the table or wherever you set it, but you won't crush the bottoms of the cuttings because the cloner is tall enough to protect them. If you turn it diagonal across the base of the clone machine, across the reservoir portion of the cloner, you do run the risk of tipping it over. I've seen it happen quite often. You get that angle going, one guy moves, the other guy moves, you push it one direction, it'll fall off a corner and you will break a lot of cuttings. Be careful. Keep in mind that those cuttings are exposed. They're sticking out of the bottom there. When you're doing work on the cloner itself, don't forget about the clones. And also, if you lift it up like it's a hatchback, if you just lift it up to look inside there, keep in mind you're probably pushing some of those clones directly into the light. You've got that T5 light hanging right above your cloner. And as you lift it, those clones on the edge closest towards you, they're moving right up and they're getting pushed into the light above you. So pay attention to the root base part of your cuttings and pay attention to the part sticking out of the top of the cloner when you're working on the inside of your clone machine. Now these cuttings, which are going to turn into clones, will live inside of our clone machine for about 14 days. In about four to seven days, you'll see little wart looking things pop up on that stem that is inside the clone machine. 
That is where the roots are going to start popping out of. By day 10, you should have nice roots coming out of there. Then by day 14, you should have a start of a little spaghetti factory just coming out of the bottom of those plants. It should look like a little set of dreadlocks hanging off of each of those plants. That is when it is time to take our new clones and put them into their soil, into their cocoa, or into their hydro setup. So that feels like a perfect spot to start wrapping up this lesson. I've already promised that in a very soon to come episode, I would talk about putting our seedlings and clones into cocoa or soil. So the only part left to talk about now is cleaning our cloner. Once you are done with the cloner, we need to clean it. I start by draining all of the water. Then I fill it up again with fresh water. I also add two or three cups of bleach, depending on the size of the cloner. Then I plug it in and I let it run overnight. The next day, I drain all of that water. If I'm not using permaclone clone collars, I throw the collars away and buy freshies. If I've got permaclones, I follow their instructions on how to sanitize and reuse them. Then I take the cloner outside and I spray it down really well with the hose to get rid of that bleach. I take it apart completely. I take the pump apart and I clean the pump completely. It is really easy to clean if you take it apart. Get a little toothbrush or a little brush and just scrub it. It does not take that long. Clean it. Then I use a paper clip or something similar to clean out all of the emitters. You guys, like I said earlier, have extra emitters on hand because when you start taking them out, they're going to break. They get brittle and they get especially more brittle after you run bleach through the machine. So clean everything up, then put it all back together. Then it is ready for use the next time you need clones. In a commercial environment, Our easy cloners, our turbo cloners, never got a break. By the time the guys could empty them, I had two more guys carrying them outside. They were hosing them down. By the time they got brought in, I had cuttings cut and ready to go into those cloners. They never get a break in a commercial environment. All right, you guys, that is my lesson on cutting clones. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, please reach out. My email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. If you feel like this episode was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to make a financial contribution to the show, you can do so by visiting patreon.com slash growfromyourheart, and all of the information you need to contribute will be right there. And once again, thank you to everybody who has contributed to the Patreon campaign. I do appreciate all of the support. I would also appreciate it if you find me on all of the social media. You can find me on Facebook. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. You can find me on Twitter. It's at GFYH Podcast. If you want to follow my personal Twitter page, it's at RastaJeff420. I highly suggest you follow my Instagram. It's Irie underscore genetics on Instagram. Check out my fine cannabis photography and join me on my Instagram live videos. If you've got something you'd like to say and you're not into the social media, or perhaps you've got a product you'd like me to review, or maybe you want to sponsor the show, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me at growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at dankseed.store. You guys, I want to thank you for listening to a long episode. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I will be back in just a few days with a fresh new episode. I want to give a huge shout out to my buddy, Kelvin Medina. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. Welcome to the show, cannabis community. It's time for episode 365 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Hella Dank Seed Company. If you need new seeds for your garden, I highly recommend the Hella Dank Seed Company, and you can find them at www.dankseed.store. I like to start the episodes off by letting you know what I'm smoking. Today, I've been taking dabs of this Bubble Jack Full Spectrum Extract, and I love the flavor and aroma of this stuff. It smells like bubble gum and cotton candy. When I dab it, it goes straight to my head. It makes my brain go super fast. It makes my mouth go super fast. So I think this will be a great concentrate for smoking before a podcast. All right, before we get too deep into this episode, I want to give a few people a shout out. I owe a big shout out to my friend, Jake Jordan. I owe a shout out to Jade and also a big shout out to Grimbold the Druid and also a shout out to Tanner Martinowick. Thanks for supporting the podcast. I really do appreciate all of the support. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be another grow lesson. I have been doing a long series of grow lessons. I hope you have been following along. If you are interested, I recommend you go back to episode 351. That's where I start this long series of grow lessons. Start there and get caught up. If you feel like you're up to speed, welcome to the grow lessons. In the last two episodes, we talked about sprouting seeds. We also talked about cutting clones. In this episode, we're going to talk about putting 
those seeds and those clones into containers of soil or soilless mix. So let's start with the seeds we talked about germinating in paper towels. I may have covered this briefly in the previous episode, but we're going to talk about it a little bit of a recap right here just to make sure everybody is up to speed. So we started a few seeds. We folded a paper towel, we soaked it, we put seeds on the paper towel, we folded it again to secure the seeds inside. Maybe we put that in a baggie, maybe we put that in a warm place. The seeds have now sprouted. Hopefully, they've got little tiny tails, maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe a half inch. Hopefully, you didn't go any more than one inch long. Here is how I recommend planting those seedlings. I generally try to stay away from recommending products. Every time I recommend a product, I get emails from people saying I did something wrong, but I want to make this easy for everybody. So I recommend Light Warrior Soil from Fox Farms for your new seedlings. It is readily available, it is affordable, and it works very well. I'm sure other people will have other ideas and other suggestions. I am okay with that. Do what you're comfortable with. I recommend this product because, like I said, it's available, it's affordable, and I know that it works. I'm not going to send people on some crazy mission looking for a product that's hard to find or overpriced. So we've got our medium. You can probably get away with one bag of Light Warrior soil. Now we need containers to put this soil in to put our seedlings in. I recommend small pots for small plants. There's no reason to fill up a big three-gallon pot and then plant a little tiny seedling in there, and then you have to water that entire space of soil. You have to put water and nutrients in all of that space just to water that plant properly. If you've got your seedling inside of a little tiny cup, you only have to water that much space. You don't have to waste water, you don't have to waste nutrients, and you don't have to waste space. A lot of new growers really like to drown seedlings in larger pots. If they put a seedling in a larger pot, they've got to water all of that soil. So they go and they pour an entire pitcher of water right on top of that three gallon pot. Then that seedling gets washed away in all that water. Who knows where it goes sometimes? When people apply water, they do it kind of heavily. The seed gets washed away. It gets lost in there. They kill the seeds. They drown. They fail with the seeds. They get discouraged. So I highly recommend starting with a smaller pot, maybe a four inch net pot, maybe a six inch net pot maybe a four inch square pot, maybe a six inch circular pot, something that size. I honestly start my seedlings in a beer cup. I take a few beer cups, I stack them up on top of each other, and then I put a drill through the bottom of them. Zip. I can go through about eight cups at a time. I poke one big hole through the bottom, then I'll do a few smaller holes on the side just to give some proper drainage. And I feel like beer cups are the perfect size for new baby seedlings. The seedlings can sprout in there, they can get a good start, they can develop a good root system, and by the time they get big enough, you can just up pot them into their three or five gallon pot and it works really well. So let's talk about actually putting these seedlings into, I'm going to go with the beer cup for this method. I've got my beer cup. I've got my light warrior soil mix. I'm going to fill my beer cup most of the way up with soil. I want to pack it down fairly tight. Then I'm going to fill it up with soil and leave myself about a quarter of an inch so that when I water, I've got plenty of room for water and it doesn't just run off the top of the cup. So I fill it up. I've got about a quarter inch of space left on the top. Then I water that soil before I even put my clone or my seedling into it. In this case, we're going to put a seedling in there. So I would water it. Since I'm going with the seedling, I do not use any nutrients at this time. I'll water it. I'll let all that water soak through the bottom. Then I take my pointer finger and I dig a little hole just right to the first knuckle of my finger. Then I put that little freshly sprouted seedling right inside that hole. If the seedling has developed a long tail, that taproot, if that taproot has gotten long, you need to make that be facing down and the seed facing up. You want the seed coming up and the taproot going down. So gently place that seed facing down or the taproot facing down, the seed pointing up, place that right in the dirt. Dig the hole as you need, as deep as you need to dig it if you've got a longer taproot. Just push your finger in there as long as you need to go. Then gently set that taproot down in there. And then you just want to put the dirt right over it real gently. You don't need to pack it down. Just make sure that it's covered up to where the light's not getting to it and it is packed in there tight enough. When you water it the next time, that water will probably pack it just tight enough for you. You don't need to press it down too much at this point. You don't want to risk crushing that seedling. So if you've got a real short tail, just go knuckle deep, drop that little seedling right in there and bury it. If you've got kind of a long tail, you've got to dig a little deeper of a hole, set that tail down in there, and then just carefully bury that. Be really careful not to disturb that white taproot. That is really delicate and it's important that it is not disrupted. Now your new seedlings are basically potted in their cups of dirt. I would place them under a T5 light with the T5 light about 8 to 12 inches away. I would try to keep them around 75 to 85 degrees and I would try to keep it quite humid around these little tiny baby plants. Now when it comes time to water these new seedlings, we have to be very careful for the first few days. I recommend using a sprayer to water new seedlings. 
I got a tiny one gallon pump sprayer from the local hardware store. I mix it with my whatever nutrient solution I'm going to use or just plain water that's been pH balanced correctly. Then I pump it real hard and I just spray the top soil with that water instead of pouring a heavy dose of water in and risking drowning those seeds or disrupting those seeds. I just spray it from the top. I kind of spray it at a few angles. That way I get all the soil saturated and it works just like the morning dew would. So I feel like spraying them is really gentle and it works really well for new growers to not drown these plants and not flood the soil when they're starting baby seedlings. Now let's briefly talk about when to start feeding our seedlings. I like to start feeding when I see the first set of truly developed leaves. When you see the first set of five or seven or nine, depending on what variety you're growing, when you see the first set of full leaves, that's when I like to start adding nutrients. Depending on your brand and your product, I usually recommend you start with about a quarter strength. If the bottle says to use 40 milliliters of a certain product, I would recommend you start with 10 milliliters of that product. And then as that plant gets bigger and stronger and more developed, then you can increase your nutrient feedings to those plants. But while they're small, let's feed them lightly so we don't roast them. Now let's talk briefly about what to feed them. These plants need a little bit of nitrogen. They need a very small amount of phosphorus and a very small amount of potassium. Most of your basic grow nutrients will be just fine for small seedlings. I would recommend adding a root inoculant product, something like Mammoth Pea, something like Great White, something like Recharge, something like Plus Life. Any of those products will work for you. Do a little bit of research, find what's available in your area, find what fits your price range, and get the product that will work best for you. Something is better than nothing when it comes to root inoculants and microbes and beneficial fungus and bacteria. I highly recommend it for small plants and I highly recommend it throughout the entire growing process. So when your plants are little, they're not going to need a whole lot of nutrients, just a base nutrient. And I highly recommend some sort of root inoculant. They won't need CalMag probably until we transplant them into the next pot. If you want to add a fulvic or a humic acid, that's always good for the plants at all stages. But at this point, I mainly like to focus on healthy plants with strong roots. So I really focus on root development at this stage of the game. I'll add microbes and beneficial fungus, and then I'll also add carbohydrates. But at this point, like I said, I am mainly focusing on root development until I transplant those plants into their next pots. So we talked a little bit about what to feed these little babies. Let's talk about pH. For small seedlings, I like to keep my pH around 5.8 to 6.2. Once they get a little bit larger, I will increase the pH slowly and I'll move up towards 6.3 or 6.4. But for these small babies, let's stay closer to 5.8 or 6.2. Now really take your time increasing the amount of nutrients you give these plants and also take your time increasing the pH of these plants. They need to grow. They need to get a root system to be able to process all of the stuff you're giving them. These little tiny plants don't want a lot and you do run the risk of burning them if you overfeed them. So pay attention and go slow. Now, after several days, these seedlings will start taking off. They'll start getting full size leaves and they will start catching up to the same size as the clones we cut. Once they reach that size, I consider them to be small veg plants and I treat them just like I do my small veg plants. And we will talk about caring for and feeding small veg plants here in the near future. Next, let's talk about planting our rapid rooters. Maybe we planted some seedlings in rapid rooters. Maybe we cut some clones into rapid rooters and put them in a dome. And now they are sprouting roots and it is time to plant them. How do we know when it is time to plant our rapid rooter seedlings or clones? I like to plant seedlings as soon as I see that first taproot coming out of the rapid rooter. I don't want to let that taproot get too long, too leggy, and too stretchy. So I do my best to get those into soil right away. When I cut clones in rapid rooters, I like to make sure they are sufficiently rooted before I try to put them into soil. Make sure your clones are properly hardened off. We talked about this in a previous episode. We have to expose our domed clones to fresh air for durations of time and extend that duration over a period of time to make sure the clones are ready to not be in a humidity controlled environment. We need to get them used to being in our regular veg environment. So we've been hardening off our clones and they show sufficient roots. What do I mean by sufficient roots? I want at least five, maybe 10 or 12 white thick roots popping out of that rapid rooter. I want them to be just busting out of there and kind of thick. I want them to look like they're just little worms coming out looking for somewhere to go. If you've got more than five, maybe more than 12, and they start building up in there, you are really doing well. We want to develop a nice root system before we pot it, but there is a fine line between just enough and too much. If you lift that little clone up out of that tray 
and the roots have begun wrapping around the rooter, you've gone too far. If those roots are hanging down inside the rooter tray and hanging into the water, we have gone too far. We want to get those into our soilless mix as soon as possible. I want just a little bit of dreadlocks just hanging out of there. Not a lot, just maybe a little tiny mop, just a little fuzzball. Maybe 10 or 20 of them just hanging out. That is prime time to pot those. And I want them about a half inch to an inch and a half long is perfect. Now let's put these rapid rooters into our beer cup full of light warrior soil or whatever size pot and whatever soil mix you choose to use. Just make sure it's a quality soil mix with plenty of aeration and make sure whatever size or whatever container you use has plenty of drainage. We don't want our plants to get muddy at the bottom, get stagnant water. That will totally drown and destroy our roots. We'll get root rot. It will be a mess. It will be disgusting. So quality soil, pots with good drainage, that is a requirement. Now, just like we did the beer cups for our small seedlings, let's fill them up with soil and leave ourselves about a quarter of an inch of space for water. Now, if I'm putting the seedlings in the rapid rooters into this soil, I most likely will not give them nutrients at this time. When I put the clones into the soil at this time, I do like to give them a small nutrient feeding. I use a light vegetative mix, about a quarter strength of whatever brand you're using. Use about a quarter strength of whatever they recommend. I also like to use a microbe product. Again, something like Mammoth Pea, something like Great White Shark, something like Recharge, something like Plus Life from Veg Bloom. Anything with beneficial fungus and bacteria that will encourage root growth will be great for your small plants. So we've got our light base nutrients. We've got our root inoculant. Let's talk about pH. I like to keep the pH for these small clones somewhere between 5.8 and 6.2. So we've got our base nutrients. We've got our root inoculant. We've got our solution pH. Now I water that solution through my cups of soil. Just pour it right on through until it drains out a little bit. You want to fully saturate that new soil. Now once it's done dripping and that soil is fully saturated, I will take two fingers and just gently make a little hole right in the center of that soil. And I go just a little bit deeper than the height of that rapid rooter. So if the rapid rooter is an inch tall, I go maybe an inch and one eighth or maybe an inch and a quarter deep. Then I get the rapid rooter out of the little tray and I set it gently inside of that hole and I do my best to not disrupt any of those roots. If it's a seedling, you've probably only got one or two roots sticking out of that rapid rooter. You need to be very careful. Gently set that in the soil. Set it right inside there, then backfill that hole really carefully over that rapid rooter. I like to go right over the top of it so you can never tell the rapid rooter was there and just a little plant is sticking up out of the soil. Be really careful if you're working with the seedling. That one tap root is all it's got to survive through at this point. If you're working with a clone, we still need to be very careful with these roots. By the way, wear rubber gloves when you're doing all this. I highly recommend rubber gloves whenever you're coming in contact, when you're putting your hands or your skin in contact with the dirt, with the roots, with the plants. Just try to wear rubber gloves if you can, or latex gloves. Try to glove up whenever possible. I would still suggest watering that rapid rooter seedling with the spray bottle, just like I recommended before, until it gets nice and large, until you're confident that you're not going to drown it. Just water it with that spray bottle. Make sure you fully saturate the soil, but it's easier to not go overboard when you're spraying with a spray bottle because you can only spray so much at a time. If you're a new grower and you don't have a lot of experience watering plants and you're new at watering the clones, don't be afraid to water them with the spray bottle also. Just get in there and saturate that soil. Keep spraying until you feel like it's saturated and then wait until it's fairly dry to water it again. You'll know when it feels real light when you pick it up, you'll say, oh, that needs water. Then just soak it until it's mostly saturated again. Eventually, you'll realize that you're spending too much time using that spray bottle to water the clones and you'll start using a more efficient method. But it's a great way to learn how to not overwater. So I basically fill my cup with soil. I moisten the soil. I make a little hole with my fingers and I set that rapid rooter right inside of that hole really gently, really careful not to damage any of those new roots. Then I carefully bury that rapid rooter with the moist soil. Then I put that cup underneath a T5 light. Again, I like to keep that light eight to 12 inches above it when they're brand new like this. I don't want to scorch them. I don't want to burn them. Then I like to keep the temperature somewhere between 75 and 85 degrees. And I try to keep the room fairly humid when I have new seedlings or young plants in the room. So that is really quickly how I put my rapid rooter seedlings and clones into cups of soil. Let's talk next about putting our clones from an easy cloner machine or a Botanicare turbo cloner into cups of soil. 
My method for potting these clones into soil starts the same as potting our seeds or potting our rapid rooters. I start by filling my cup or my desired container with a light warrior or my desired soilless mix about a quarter inch away from the top. I then saturate that soil the same as I did with my other cloning method. I use about a quarter strength of my vegetative newt and I like to use plenty of microbes. Then I adjust the pH between 5.8 and 6.2. Now when we cut these clones, I said to leave about an inch underneath the neoprene collar into the water getting hit by that sprayer. That entire inch should have roots popping out of it. We should have a nice little mop of roots before we try to pot these. So I've got my cup of moistened soil. I've got a well-rooted clone. Now I usually grab the cup with my right hand. I use the pointer finger on my left hand and I just poke a hole about an inch and a half deep right into that soil. Now I may widen that hole up a little bit depending on the root mass coming off of that clone. If there are a lot of roots, I need more room. I don't want to crowd or crush the roots into that soil. I like to lower the clone down into the soil and let those roots spread as far as they can get. So if you've got something hanging off, try not to squish them, try not to coil them. We want to encourage those roots to spread out as far as they can go. If you've got a lot of roots, maybe make a small cone of soil in the bottom of the cup, a little triangle, so that the roots can hit that triangle and spread out around that instead of getting into a ball. We want the roots spread out. That is really important. If we tangle them up, if we twist them, they'll just suffocate themselves and they will kill the plant and the clone will not survive at all. Now, if your roots have gotten excessively long, I recommend you trim some off. If they're more, than six or seven inches long, just go ahead and trim the bottoms of those roots off. Your plants will thank you for it. They won't have so much root mass twisted up in the bottom of that cup trying to figure out what to do. You'll just have a nice thick root mass started and it works a little bit like topping your plants. You've just created more sections for that root zone to branch out from so your plants will appreciate it. So you pop that clone up out of the easy cloner. You've got the neoprene disc. You take the neoprene disc off. You put that back in the hole so the water doesn't go spraying anywhere. You've probably got the cloner turned on while you're potting the clones. Then you take that clone and you just set it right inside that hole that you've created in the soil. But as you lower it down into there, try to spread the roots out. If they're just short and stubby, they're going to go the direction they want to go. If they're getting long enough to where you can stretch them or move them and encourage them which direction to go, try to make them spread out like an umbrella. We want to get them nice and far. If they're really long, you can put soil in the cup, lower some of the roots down into the cup, then sprinkle more soil on top of that, then lower more roots down into the cup, and then sprinkle more soil on top of that. Then, no matter how much soil you use, no matter how long the roots are, we need to bury that clone deep enough into this cup to give it some support to stand straight up. We need to get the soil tight enough around it and get it deep enough in there to get the clone to support itself and stand straight up. But at the same time, we need to not bury it so deep that we cause root rot on that short stem that is there. So we put one inch of it underneath the neoprene disc getting sprayed by the water. So we've got roots about one inch. Then that neoprene disc is about a quarter of an inch deep. So I would say probably plant it somewhere between one and a quarter and one and a half inches deep into your medium. Now we've already moistened the soil so the nutrients are in there. The next thing to do is to move our potted clones underneath a T5 light. Again, for freshly potted plants, I like to keep that T5 about eight to 12 inches away. I will lower that light as the plants get stronger. I just don't want to move them right under there right away and scorch them and burn them and give them the opportunity to stress out. For these new baby clones, I like to keep the temperature between 75 and 85 degrees, and I do like high humidity. It depends on how much airflow I've got in the room. It depends on my environment. It depends on the situation. If I've got plenty of airflow, if I can have air exchange, I will put higher humidity in the room. If I feel like there's not a lot of airflow and it will create problems, I will reduce the humidity accordingly. I know I keep stressing it, but the most important thing to think about when you are potting these clones from the Easy Cloner, from the Turbo Cloner, is to not let those dangly roots wrap up on themselves. Don't let them bind. Don't let them smother themselves. Don't let them suffocate themselves. These cloning machines can make roots explode. You'll look in there on day five and you won't have any roots. You'll look in there on day six. You'll be getting roots. You'll go away for the weekend. You'll come back over the weekend on Monday. The roots are hanging down into the water. They go crazy very quickly. You will see what I'm talking about when you get it dialed in. Don't take those fat clones with big, crazy roots and kill them by suffocating them, by coiling them up in your soil. All right, so at this point, 
We have got a bunch of seedlings or a bunch of clones in small pots or cups. We've got them underneath T5 lights or whatever light you've got available. Maybe you've got an LED. Maybe you've got a small HPS, maybe a 250 or a 400. If you're using something larger that works, just keep it further away. Just raise it up real high. So we've got it under an acceptable light. We've got it in a desirable climate, which is around 75 to 85 degrees with the appropriate humidity. Hopefully you've got somewhere between 50 and 75% humidity for your small plants. I would suggest either 24 hours on or possibly 20 on and four off, or a lot of people like to do 18 hours on and six hours off for our new small plants. Also, I would recommend a light fan on these plants. Just a fan to keep the air moving around them will prevent the plants from getting leggy and stretchy. And I think it just makes tougher, more robust plants when you put a little breeze on them. So at this point, the clones are now in our small veg phase. In a very short time, those seedlings will catch up to what I consider the small veg phase, which is when they're about six inches tall and they've got a couple of nice sets of leaves and they can start taking small veg nutrients. I plan on doing a complete episode on small veg here in the very near future. That episode will include recommended light cycles for your veg plant. That episode will include recommended nutrient schedules for your veg plant. I'll also talk about optimal environmental conditions for your small veg plants. Then we'll talk about transplanting our plants into their finishing pots, and we will consider that large veg, and then we will begin to talk about our large veg phase. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are having as much fun with these grow lessons as I am. I would love to hear your feedback. Reach out to me on Twitter or through email. On Twitter, it's at GFYH Podcast. And of course, the email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. And if you feel like this episode was educational, informative, or entertaining, and you would like to make a financial contribution to the show, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash growfromyourheart. And all of the information you need to become a patron will be right there on the screen. And I do appreciate all of the support from everybody who has contributed. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you again for listening to the podcast. I know this was sort of a short episode, but I feel like I did a good lesson. I taught you well how to transplant your new babies. I feel like there was not a lot of fluff or a lot of BS to filter through. I feel like a lot of people can learn from this one, and that is the point. So short and sweet, right to the point. We served our purpose. I think Mike is on his way over, so we will record a long and rambly episode that will make up for the short episode I did today. You guys, I want to thank you again for listening. I would appreciate it if you find me on all of the social media. You can find me on Facebook. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast. You can find me on Twitter. It's at GFYH podcast. If you'd like to follow my personal Twitter feed, it's at RastaJeff420. I also recommend you follow my Instagram feed. On Instagram, I use Irie underscore genetics. I post a lot of fine cannabis photography. I like to go on Instagram live and hang out. I answer questions. I talk to my friends. I take dabs. If you come on my Instagram live feed and you ask a question, there's a very good chance I will answer your question there on the Instagram live feed. So follow me once again. It's Irie underscore genetics on Instagram. If you've got something you'd like to say, perhaps you'd like to sponsor the show, or maybe you've got a product you'd like me to review. Maybe you're not into the social media and you just want to say hi. You can reach out through email. My email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. You know I would love to hear all of your feedback. Also, don't forget about the YouTube channel. Every episode is now available on YouTube. Simply search for the Grow From Your Heart podcast on YouTube. Give us a subscribe. Leave me some comments. I would love your support on the YouTube channel. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, the Hella Dank Seed Company. You can find them at www.dankseed.store. You guys, I'll be back in just a few days with a fresh new episode. Thanks again for listening. I want to give a huge shout out to my friend, Mangled Remains. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mama a hug for me. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed.